Please rise for the pledge of the flag and the invocation. Lord, we thank you for our freedom and democracy. We thank you for our customs and our heritage. We thank you for our rights and the ability to express ourselves individually. Enlighten us with your guidance so we may follow a positive path. Amen. Amen. Jimmy Myers in here to fix his chair. Court call the roll. Mayor Stafford. Here. Alderman Lincoln. Here. Alderman Sahaski. Here. Alderman Weston. Here. Alderman Sherman. Here. Alderman Thompson. Here. Alderman Woodward. Here. Attorney Hawthorne. Here. All present, Your Honor. Thank you. Item one. Resolve that the um, minutes of the Common Council meeting of February 6, 2001 are hereby approved. Motion. Move it. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Next item. Yeah. Resolved that the city clerk's annual report for fiscal year 2000 in the amount of $72,454.20 is hereby received, approved, and placed on file. Motion. I move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> item carried. Next item. <coughs> Resolved that city clerk is hereby authorized and directed to advertise for a public hearing to be held on Tuesday, March 20th in the council chambers of the municipal building relative to a proposed local law which would authorize the expansion of the Fulton Empire Zone to include portions of the town of Granby and town of Valdi and the designation of a zoning board member from the town of, Gran town of Granby. Mayor. Uh, roughly, where is the expansion going? The expansion, uh, this is the Empire Zone is what is replacing the old uh, EDZ Zone. Mm -hmm. And there are areas out on Route 3 in Granby that will be added. There's also areas uh, at the Industrial Park at the airport. Okay. And I believe Interface, here, Solutions. Interface Solutions. I'm sure. Well, the other one was. Uh, um, yeah, it would just help me. Up, oh, the airport, but also uh, the bottling plant. Wasn't that going on there? Okay, that's one of the things that was being looked at. All right. Okay, thanks. That's what it is. Do we hear a motion? Move move it. It. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion's carried. Next item. Resolved that the mayor be authorized to sign the supplemental agreement between the city of Fulton and the New York State Department of Transportation for the reverse betterment project, Route 3 and Route 481. Mr. Cruck, would you uh, let the council know what uh, this is about? We have a supplemental agreement uh, before you uh, with uh, Blaslin, Balk, and Lee. In the process of the 481 planning, we asked uh, BBNL to do a lot of different alternatives for us, a number of options for us to look at, and in doing that, it exceeded the cost of the original supplemental agreement. So we reviewed it uh, and sent it to, to the state, and they reviewed it, and they are prepared to pay it, and that's what's before you right now. Are there any questions? No. Do we hear a motion? I move it. Second? All second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Next item. Resolve that the annual maintenance agreement for fiscal year 2001 with Altel in the amount of $1,227 hereby approved. That is the maintenance agreement on the whole system within this building? Yes. Okay. Motion? Move it. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Next item.
resolved that the reappointment of Alan Mosier, 771 South 1st Street, Fulton, New York, to the Fulton Planning Commission, effective February 15th, 2001, and to expire February 14th, 2004, is hereby approved. Motion? Move it. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Next item. Resolved that the reappointment of Robert Jennings, 46 West 4th Street, Fulton, New York, to the Fulton Planning Commission, effective February 15th, 2001, and to expire February 14th, 2004, is hereby approved. Motion? Move it. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Next item. Resolved that Chapter 165, Subsection 165-61, Vehicle and Traffic Ordinance of the City of Fulton, entitled Parking Prohibited at Certain Hours, be amended to read as follows. Delete. Park and Shop Plaza, 130 a.m. to 6 a.m. All, all hours from November 1st to April 1st. And Canal Parking Lot, 130 a.m. to 6 a.m. All hours from November 1st to April 1st. In the explanation, uh, this is being deleted because is, is it already addressed in section 165.35 by schedule by virtue of the schedule in 165.32. So this was a duplication within the charter. That's why it is being deleted. Do I hear a motion? Move it. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Opposed? Motion carried. Next item. Resolved that the mayor be authorized to sign the 2001, fun 2001 funding contract between the city of Fulton and operation of Swigo County in the amount of $10,000. Said cost is a budgeted item and to be a direct charge to the A6989 account. Any discussion? Do I hear a motion? I'll move it. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I'm opposed. Motion carried. Next item. John, are we uh, okay for item ten? I think we're okay to authorize. But we can authorize the bid. Okay. Your Honor, do we have the money to do that project this year? The pier? That, that is the grant, the, the Parks and Recreation grant. So we're all set then? Yes. Resolved that the city clerk be authorized and directed to advertise to receive sealed bids in his office and municipal building on or before March 19th, 2001, up to 2 p.m. and to be publicly open at 2.15 p.m. that same day in the council chambers for the construction of a pier at Bullhead Point in accordance with specifications prepared by the Fulton Engineering Department. Do I hear a motion? I'll move in. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Next item. Resolve that the mayor be authorized to sign a three-year contract with Upstate Administrative Services for the administration of health care benefits. Do I hear a motion? Move it. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Next item. As the city clerk was authorized and directed to advertise for a public hearing to be held at this meeting of February 20th, 2001, regarding the proposed local law which would amend section C-152K of the Fulton City Charter entitled Demolition. Mayor Stafford will declare this public hearing open. At this time, I would uh, ask that the city attorney just uh, brief us on what this change entails. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. This. Uh request came from the codes chief. Um, chief Correa indicated that there were some demolition permits being requested and he
he had noticed that it didn't appear that there was any um, anything in our city statutes that allowed a uh, duration to be put on how long the demolition permit uh, could be issued for. In other words, could somebody get a permit and not demolish a building in a year or two years or whatever. Uh, so what we essentially did this language mirrors what's now done on a building permit, um, maximum of one year, and the codes chief has the option, depending on the situation, to make that even less when the permit is issued. And the second uh, requested change is that the bureau chief would have the discretion to require a performance bond. Um, and that would be if there's a big project uh, that would entail a lot of um, a lot of uh, traffic issues and things like that that uh, we certainly uh, would want to be able to control that a little better and if somebody walked away from the middle of a demolition we would want a performance bond so that we could uh, invoke that bond and go ahead and finish the project so those are the changes that are requested thank you is there anyone in the audience that would care to speak on this issue Is there anyone on the council that has any questions or would care to speak on this? Your Honor, just, just to make sure we got a bond when they do something like this. A bond and a time limit to complete the demolition. One year? One, no more than one year. It can be even less, depending on the circumstances. Okay. If there is no other input, I will ask for a motion to close the public hearing. I'll offer that. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion is carried. Whereas the mayor, members of the council, and all in the tenants have been given an opportunity to give their written or oral comments regarding said proposed local law, therefore be it resolved that the proposed local law amending section C 152K, the Fulton City Charter, is hereby approved. Is there a motion? I'll offer it. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Next item. <coughs> Whereas the city clerk was authorized and directed to advertise for a public hearing to be held at this common council meeting of February 20th, 2001, relative to a proposed zone change request for the property located on the southwest corner of Oneida and South 7th Street for change of zone from C1 commercial to C2 commercial for the purpose of constructing a Wilson Farms at said location. Mayor Stafford will declare this public hearing open. I realize that there are a number of people here tonight that would uh, are going to want to speak on this issue. So I'm going to have to ask uh, that those speaking please limit their comments to from three to five minutes. And when you make the comments, please come to the microphone and state your name and your address, please. Now, before this is open, uh, would the people from uh, representing uh, the developer care to put on a presentation to let people know just what is proposed? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, good evening, my name is Devin Dalpas. I'm with the Laker Development Group, and if you'll permit me, I'll pass these out to the board. What we're proposing to do is rezone an area of the city that's currently zoned C1 commercial to C2 commercial. Uh, the area that we're seeking this rezoning uh, consists of about four lots, formerly the home of Fulton Builder Supply. Uh, the reason for the request is uh, for the demolition of five buildings uh, with about 15,000 square foot of, uh, of buildings, uh, both masonry and wood um, structures. Demolish those 15,000 square foot of build, feet of building and construct a um, 2,835 square foot neighborhood grocery store with four gasoline pumps. The current C1 zoning permits us to construct that building, uh, the neighborhood grocery store as it is. However, to make this project feasible, uh, our tenant requires gasoline sales and thus we're asking for the rezoning. 
the total investment of this project to the city uh, or in the city of Fulton is close to a million dollars uh, with the gasoline equipment as well. Um, the property would be developed by us, which is Laker Development Group, and leased to Wilson Farms for a period of 20 years uh, and guaranteed by their parent company, Royal Ahold. Um, basically, what that amounts to is a 20-year is a commitment. Uh, they also have options that bring them out to, I believe it's 49 years uh, total. Uh, a commitment on the part of Royal Ahold, uh, in addition to the tops that they already own in town and the other Wilson Farms that they already own in town on the other side of the river uh, for another period of at least 20 years. Uh, I think most of you will agree that those two stores that currently exist in the city are good neighbors, uh, well maintained, uh, good employers, good contributors to the tax base uh, and the economy as a whole. And because of that relationship on the part of uh, Wilson Farms and Royal Ahold, they would like to continue to do that. And they see the city of Fulton as uh, an area that could use um, an additional store. Uh, they've done demographic research and determined that for what they do, their concept of a neighborhood grocery store, uh, this is a, an excellent site for that use and uh, would like to locate it there. Uh, just as a Another point, this, uh, this property has been on the market for over two and a half years. Um, it's deteriorating on a daily basis, especially not being occupied. Uh, it's dark. It's an inviting to, uh, to less desirable uh, activities at nighttime. Um, and this project will obviously change that significantly uh, by tearing down those buildings and creating a site that you see there. The first picture that you see is uh, the green area is, is that green. Uh, it does go a little bit on the, the neighboring properties to the south there for the illustration purposes, primarily because I'm not very good at using this particular program. <laughs> so you'll have to excuse me on that. But you can see the property lines that are around the property there. Uh, there's a significant amount of green area, area that will be landscaped. You can also see the paved areas, uh, plenty of circulation, uh, plenty of parking. There's about 14 parking spaces, including a handicapped space. Uh, there are only two curb cuts to this site. One is on uh, 7th, the other is on Oneida Street. Uh, currently, there is no real curb cut. The whole thing is one big curb cut going around the property. So what we're doing is controlling that curb cut, creating a much safer um, situation that it than what currently exists, increasing sight lines significantly. If you recall, on, I think it's either the second or third page of that uh, package that you have in front of you that you can see a bunch of black building-like things on the property. Uh, those, that's it right there. Uh, SP03. SP03, thank you. Uh, that shows you the existing buildings. As you can see, they go right out to the corner pretty much, uh, and it cuts down sight distances. So. Uh, with this change, you're going to be able to see significantly around that corner and enhance the, uh, the safety of that intersection substantially. Um, are there any questions for me with respect to general site plan questions? What I'm going to do is introduce you to Ian Williams, uh, representative of Wilson Farms, who can talk to you a little bit about hours of operation, safety, employees, that type of thing, life safety, especially with respect to uh, the, uh, the fuel systems. Uh, there is a significant change in the federal guidelines these days with respect to fuel systems, how they're installed, how they're maintained, how they're monitored with respect to uh, those facilities that may have been in existence a lot longer. Um, you have some of those facilities in town. Uh, they had to bring their equipment up to newer specifications. However, um, uh, any contamination they may have uh, made prior to that, they should have made some, some changes to. The new standards basically prohibits or, or uh, controls any kind of um, safety concerns with respect to any kind of leakage and that kind of stuff, but you know, go through that a little bit more significantly. Any questions? Yes, sir. I have uh, a question. It doesn't appear to be in the plan to put a sidewalk along South 7th Street, which would be on the east side of the project. I think that could be, a, I, it's probably an oversight on the part okay. of uh, the architect, and that certainly would be done. All right. And I have had some uh, neighbors to that property uh, that reside on Cayuga Street. Right now, they have considerable privacy in their backyard due to the 
buildings that are that are there and they are concerned about the loss of privacy if the buildings are torn down uh, are, do the plans include some sort of privacy fencing on the south and uh, west side of the properties? Uh, to my re recollection on the site plans, it does not show that, uh, but if that is the pleasure of the board, then certainly we'll do so. Um, in doing so, or in, in asking that of the developer, I would also ask that you tell us how high you would like it, whether it's six feet, eight feet, uh, because different towns have different standards on height. You're allowed to put up a six foot, but you need a variance for eight, that type of thing. So well, that would be looked into, but I would, mm -hmm. I would also think that if this project was to take place, that there would definitely need to be uh, some sort of perimeter fencing on the, uh, on the west and south side of the project just to prevent uh, people trespassing through yards to get there. Certainly. Yeah, and a privacy fence would definitely be required of some sort. Okay. I honestly, um, <laughs> I apologize for not reviewing that issue before coming to the board this evening to determine whether or not it was actually included in those drawings. It may be on there, but uh, we will make sure that it does go on there. Well, so just so I make sure that I've got those two things, there would be a sidewalk along 7th as well as fencing to the south and west. Any new structure um, would go before the Planning Commission for site plan review anyways. Yes, sir. And I know that they would uh, be very um, strict as far as what they would expect of the property. So uh, that's just another step in the process. I know that you've noticed on here, because uh, I remember the last, uh, well, there was 16 different landscaping um, that you were going to do, so I would assume that in the mayor's uh, questioning whether uh, there would also be a fence up there, I would think that that would, that would certainly be part of it. Yes. And the more green, the better. Yes, right now there's, there's virtually no green on the site. I think you can see that from that uh, SP3. Uh, yes. you know, you've got buildings, you've got gravel parking areas, uh, but any green areas is really you know, weeds and scrub that have kind of popped up and around. Any other questions from the site? Anyone else? Well, on the council. I, I, have a, I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, it kind of doesn't really pertain to this right here, but it, it's to what you were saying about TAPS and Wilson Farms being a, uh, a good to the community and the whole nine yards. I was wondering if uh, Wilson Farms or uh, your parent company has any uh, long range plans to implement maybe another Wilson Farm someplace else. Uh, somewhere else in the city. It, it's, a, it's a vague question. Um, I'm just curious if Wilton Farms or TAPS has a long range plan of maybe sticking another Wilton Farm somewhere else in the city. At, at the moment, we do not. Do you want me to identify myself first? Right. Uh, Ian Williams, I'm the director of real estate for Wilson Farms, for the Wilson Farms division, part right. of Tops Markets. It was just a general question I wanted um, to ask. We, we, we have looked at several sites within the city of Fulton. Uh, we, we've looked at a, a couple of others in, in addition to this one. We have yet to find one that we think we could serve the needs of the, of the community and, and have the customer base we would need to, to, to make it work. Uh, but we are still looking. So, I mean, we, we, you'd, we be, do. you'd be looking outside the old uh, lumber mill down at Oneida Street for another place, well, too. I mean, like. We, uh, for, for maybe a third Wilson Farms? Yeah, let me, I let, guess let, that's what I'm getting let, at. Let, let, me, let me answer this, answer it a little differently. Uh, we are not looking for an alternate site to this site. I understand that. Okay, however, we are looking for additional sites within the city limits. Right. To service the community where we've proposed to build this store, we do not have any alternate sites in mind. Right. No, I, that's, that's okay. you answered my question, that's what I wanted to ask, and you answered it. Uh, so I do understand that if you got this site, there, you, you're still looking for other sites as well. That's correct. Okay. Within we we haven't found any we can make work yet, but we are desirous to be in your city. Well, you probably do the same type of market study that you did with this. That's correct. Right. Okay. Okay. Are there any other questions? 
cover the uh, hour. Yeah, if there aren't any, if there aren't any more questions for, for Devin, I'll, I'll continue. Uh, in in uh, partly in response to your other, your your comment, but we do have a research department that does come out and research uh, different sites and identify areas where we think that we can be a service to the community and, and run a profitable business. And our research department came out and identified this location as, as one that, that we would like to make a 20 year commitment to. What, what would be the criteria for well, making a commitment to a site? There, there, there are a lot of different criteria, but a uh, big portion of it would be uh, traffic count, would be uh, population within half a mile, population within a one mile radius, uh, typically, a Wilson Farms doesn't pull beyond a one-mile radius. In fact, for this particular location, I, th I think our numbers were based more on the half-mile radius. Um, and, and then they, they look at competition and whether or not they think competition is serving the needs of the niche that we service. Uh, as we're a neighborhood food store, we're not a convenience store, we're not a grocery store. We're, we're somewhere in between. We right. also look at the walk-in business in the right. neighborhood. Yes, it, yes. We, traffic counts being both pedestrian traffic and as well vehicular traffic. So basically what you just said is you look at competition in an area and then you kind of go in and compete. No, we look at an area right. to see what kind of population is there, right. to see what kind of customer base right. we could have. Right. and then. In addition to that, we look at what competition is there and That's what, what I mean. What, but if I heard you correctly, the way you suggested is we look at competition first and then see no. who we could steal no, from. No. We, we look at what the total business is in the area and then see if the current competition serves that need. And if it doesn't serve the need, we would like to go in and, and help serve that need. And, and we think there's an opportunity to see, serve a need that is not being serviced in that neighborhood today. As part of our development, um, gasoline has become critical for us from a profitability standpoint. Um, the gasoline to us is, is, uh, is, is just another uh, part of the business, another income generating part of the business, another rack of, of candy, so to speak. We do not have a predatorial uh, position with gasoline. We do not come in trying to uh, destroy the gasoline market put such a price that's, that's so low that, that the whole market falls down. I mean, we come in specifically just for the additional income with gasoline. It also, we have found, has uh, been an added service to our customers. They have a one-stop shop for some fill-in groceries, some convenience items. We're very strong in coffee. Um, and gasoline is just another one of the services now that we provide. We, we all understand that the only reason that we're here tonight is due to the gasoline. Yes. If it wasn't for the gasoline pumps, probably you would already have the store built. Yes. Okay. And uh, if, if I may add to, to that comment, we actually looked at, based on the comments uh, from, from the presentation last time we were in front of this board, we actually looked at whether or not, if the bank were willing to forgive the loan on the property, and if the property were thus free, could we afford to develop on this property with our store only without gasoline? Thinking that might actually be a possibility if we pursued it. We were unable to make it work. Now, in saying that, we actually have an opportunity a year or a year and a half from now, possibly. I don't yet have it in my, uh, in my arsenal of stores to build, but we are acquiring the Grand Union stores up in the Adirondacks. The Grand Union stores are 10 to 15 to 25,000 square feet and bigger. They have meat programs, a butcher, and we have yet as a company to be able to service uh, the needs of, of the customers with a 10,000 to 30,000 square foot stores. We do well on 30 to 35,000 and bigger. We do well on the 3,000 square foot Wilson Farms. We have not been able to find a way to make that store in between work. A year from now, we may very well come back to the city if we don't have the approval tonight for gasoline or don't get approval for gasoline and say, we've acquired the Grand Unions, we understand how to operate them, we would like to propose a 10,000 square foot store with a butcher on the site, and I think we would be within our zone rights. So we have that possibility in the future. I prefer not to 
hang my hat on that because I don't know that we'll be able to run them profitably. I don't know that we'll be able to make it work on this site. I do know today that we have a site plan and a business that we know how to run that we know we can do profitably and I think serves the needs of the customers in that area better than possibly another store with another butcher. As you know, we have, there is a competitor around the corner that does have meat. Yes. And I prefer to service the needs that he's not servicing rather than compete head to head with him with a butcher Etc. as I just explained, could come up a year from now. Um, the, uh, the hours of operation for our store are typically 6 a.m. to midnight. If the board has issue with those hours, uh, we certainly can, can address those and, and respond to those. Uh, we do have some stores that open earlier at 5 a.m. because there happens to be uh, the traffic there to support the operating hours. But again, if there's an issue with the hours, I'd be happy to address them. Um, I do have I do have a, a fuel presentation that is on my laptop, and I apologize. I was unable to get printed copies. It, go, it, it shows some of the, the safety features of gasoline. I could talk through them. I could show them to you if you need a visual. But uh, if, if I may, I'll, I'll start. And if, if the board would uh, like me to come in front of each member, I'll be happy to show you what uh, what the pictures are that help illustrate what it is I'm, I'm referring to. I, I assume that this is not visible. <laughs> yeah. Um, let, let me just talk through it, and if there's any questions, if, if you'd like further clarification uh, on what's on the photo, I'll be happy to show the board. We will have, as part of part of DEC, most, most of these, we do some things over and above, but most of these are DEC requirements. If you put gasoline, you have to have this. We are stage two vapor recovery, which means Stage one, by the way, is, is uh, at the car. Uh, but stage two is where the vapors really become an issue for the surrounding area. Stage two is when the tanker delivers fuel into the tank. Vapors go through a, a vapor port, which are then collected by hose and put back into the truck. So stage two vapor recovery is designed specifically to capture vapors. The fuel uh, port where you, you connect from the truck to the tank has a little window. And on that window, you can actually see the product going through the, uh, uh, through, through the, through the, the nozzle uh, into the tank so you know as, as it's moving product. Tanks, by law, have to be stopped at 90% of tank capacity. That is designed specifically so you cannot have an overflow. If there ever, and, and, and the policy is, and, and the law is, you have to stick to tanks before to make sure there's enough room, check the tank capacity, make sure that what you're putting from the truck into the tank can fit. If ever there's a mistake, of course, there's, there's, there could be human error involved here. If ever there's a mistake and there is an overflow uh, concern, there's a, a mechanism in the, va in the, in the pipe into the tank where a baffle comes up and shuts off shuts off the flow of product at 90% of the tank capacity. The driver then shuts off the fuel at the tanker. He has then a hose that can hold as much as 30 gallons. The valve that shuts off the product will allow a very slow, continuous drip of, of product until that 30 gallons goes in. It could take him another five minutes or so for that product to go in the tank. But th there are no overflow concerns. In addition, when he pulls that nozzle off, if there's any spillage, it goes into a containment box, again, by law. And that containment box has a little plug you just put right into the tank. Uh, the tanks, when they're installed, I think actually I have a photograph. Uh, <coughs> we're able to get two photographs printed. I apologize, I don't have copies. Sorry, here. The tanks. I put in a concrete slab with tie downs. I don't think there's a, a, uh, a high water table here. I don't think that's an issue, but if ever there was, uh, the tanks are tied down. They cannot pop up out of the ground. The tanks are double wall fiberglass. The lines from the tanks are triple wall fiberglass. Um, 
They have uh, brine inside, there's interstitial space inside the tank. If there's ever a leak, there are monitoring systems that work 24 hours a day. We have a third party monitor those. If ever there's a problem, it's not just people on our site having to see it. We have a monitoring system that picks up on that. Inside uh, or above the tank is a submersible pump. That is where the mechanism is to transfer the product from the tank. Uh, to the dispensers and to the lines. That also that is also in a fully contained uh, box. So if ever that leaked, that goes into the containment box. Again, you would have alarms going off saying that there's a leak. Above the dispensers of fire suppression, uh, by law, local fire marshal will work out how many nozzles he wants to spray, et cetera, et cetera. The, every fire marshal could be different on their requirements, but you have fire suppression, and that's automatic. It it it, uh, it goes off by heat sensors. Underneath the dispenser is also a fully contained box, so if ever there's a leak inside the dispenser, you see product uh, underneath in that fully contained box. Nothing in the system goes directly to the ground. Um, as I said, you got triple wall fiberglass lines, double wall tank. Is so, this the same technology that was used at the other Wilson Farm store for the gas? Uh, some of it may not have been. Uh, at a minimum, yes. Uh, I, I believe the triple wall fiberglass lines are an added improvement. DEC requires double. We're now putting in triple anyway. Uh, but everything else I think pretty much is, is there. And of course there's an automatic shutoff switch inside uh, the store. If ever there were a problem, there's a drive off, there's a, a catastrophic accident, uh, there is a shutoff switch that if, if ever there were a problem, the, uh, the cashier can shut the products off, or shut, shut the uh, pumps down. And I do have one other photograph that I can hand out, and it, and it deals with security. We do have cameras on our canopy columns uh, to monitor what's happening there. Uh, people aren't in the back looking at the camera. They use it in case there's a problem. Um, as I said, you have cashiers who are up front. They're actually monitoring it in person. But if ever there were an issue, we have cameras as well. And that, of course, is a deterrent to any kind of mischief, thievery, hanging out, that kind of stuff. And that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? <coughs> oh, yes. We have uh, typically about 20 employees between full-time and part-time. Uh, the lighting for the location, uh, we now have in our canopy lighting recessed lights, so there is no spillover. Uh, the, the light is actually above the deck of the canopy, so it, it shines well underneath, but does not spill over beyond, uh, beyond the canopy area. Uh, what we design is what we think a, a well-lit location. Uh, we don't certainly want to light up the whole street corner, but we want to have enough lighting where it's safe where our customers feel safe, and it deters people hanging out. Mm -hmm. Now that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? Mm. Anyone have any questions on anyone on the council? Uh, I'm going to have Dennis Hawthorne uh, Jr. just <clears throat> talk to you a bit about a couple other points that we'd like to make. Okay. Good evening, gentlemen. I haven't got much new, if anything new, to say that wasn't mentioned last time when we were here in the fall. As you know, we need to make a complete record, so I just remind you of a couple of those points. Uh, again, for background, I've been representing the uh, Collins, Collinses in connection with their attempts to sell the site uh, for some time, and it is through them and after we became a contract to sell it to the Wilson Farms representatives that I started helping out uh, the Wilson Farms people and uh, coordinating uh, attendance at these hearings. I can tell you from working with the Collins uh, all this time that they've received no other significant meaningful offers for the sale or purchase of this property. Uh, they are very much financially distressed, as you know, uh, just from seeing the fact that the uh, lumberyard is no longer operating. Uh, they owe a significant mortgage uh, to a local lending institution, which so far has withheld uh, taking uh, any action to try to enforce that mortgage. Uh, and I think I pointed out to you last fall, uh, I found that a little odd at one point, so I contacted the lender and said, well, 
thank you very much for being so patient and not foreclosing, and I was told they have no intention of foreclosing. Uh, the potential liabilities that would come with uh, the lender having to take over control uh, and potential resale or demolition of the site is more than that lender uh, will accommodate. So again, as I, I just mentioned to you in passing last time, and again, I. I I don't want you to take this as, as any kind of threat. I don't mean it that way. I'm just setting out the reality because the bank representative is not able to be here tonight. He asked me to relay this to you, that the bank's not going to seek it back or force a sale of it on foreclosure. And again, I'll leave it to you uh, to think about what that would mean if this property, if the taxes continue to not be paid uh, at that time. Are there any questions for me as, representatives of, uh, as a representative of uh, the Collins family at this point? If there aren't, I would. Uh, there were two uh, other uh, individuals who could not be present tonight uh, who wanted to uh, place their input onto the record uh, of this hearing. Uh, and if I may, I'll uh, read their statements into the record and then ask that uh, the paper statements themselves be made a part of the record. One of them, you've heard it, uh, the, the same statement. That's Russ Johnson, uh, who is a county legislator. Uh, who owns premises and continues to own premises directly across Oneida Street from the site. I believe the premises address is 619 Oneida Street. He's currently renting that property out because he and his uh, wife and growing family moved into a larger home uh, last fall on Burley Terrace. Uh, I'll read this into the record. Again, forgive me, I believe you already heard it, but I believe we need to make a complete record. Uh, letter, it was dated October 3rd in connection with that meeting. Uh, dear gentlemen, please accept this correspondence in my absence and kindly make it part of the record since I am unable to attend this important hearing due to a previously scheduled work conflict. This evening, you will listen to members of the public as they speak both for and against the proposed zone change from C1 Commercial to C2 Commercial of the Fulton Builder Supply Commercial property. As the county legislator whose district adjoins this property, I am compelled to convey to you that I am unequivocally in support of this zone change as it will clearly serve the bigger good of our great city that our great city so desperately deserves. The existing Fulton Builder Supply property is a deteriorating empty building that is a significant risk of danger to the neighborhood. It is a hazardous object of attraction that could potentially draw in curious children looking for another place to play and is a concerning target for criminal mischief including arson. As you are aware, the present C1 commercial zone does not preclude Wilson Farms from building a convenience store at the site right now. In fact, C1 Commercial would permit many types of businesses to locate at the property without any public input, such as other retail stores or even a bar, tavern, or local neighborhood pub. In actuality, this very public hearing this evening boils down to one, or to merely one issue, do we or do we not want gas pumps? If having gas pumps is a neighborhood safety concern, bear in mind that stringent DEC and EPA mandates and regulations over the years have been both dependable and trustworthy in assuring health and safety for us all. We must continue to rely on our local, state, and federal governments to that regard. Wilson Farms has established a history of being a responsible business and a good member of our community. Although I empathize with those who are not in favor of this proposed zone change, I, I view this proffer as a positive direction for our city. Fulton will generate much needed sales tax revenue and realize additional economic growth. Wilson Farms will help in the fight to keep property taxes stabilized and the property will become much safer for the community, plus it will be much more aesthetically pleasing than the current buildings are. Additionally, Wilson Farms will offer yet another beneficial service to the neighborhood. As you all know, I also bring a perspe personal perspective to the table, having been a resident who, up to last month, lived with my family practically within, arm within arm's reach from the property for nearly my entire life. I've seen Fulton Builder Supply at its peak with incessant vehicular and pedestrian traffic flowing in and out of the business with rapid frequency. I cannot recall a single incident when such a heavy flow of traffic had caused a major inconvenience to the neighborhood. I do not suspect that this would happen with Wilson Farms convenience store and gas pumps at the site in the future. Gentlemen, as you decide on the future of the Fulton Builders Supply property, I am confident that in the end you will collectively make the right decision that will clearly be for the bigger good of the entire city. I wish you all well and express a heartfelt thank you for taking the time to listen and, more importantly, for all that you do for the future of this great city of Fulton. Signed, Russ W. Johnson. Also, I'd offer into the record a statement dated today's date 
uh, from Gay Musumici, who owns a property on the northwest corner of Oneida and 7th Street. That's 623 Oneida Street. I spoke to her this morning. She, uh, you may recall, was present the last time around, asked a couple of questions. Uh, she is ill and unable to attend tonight. She's got this bug that's going around. So she faxed us through and asked if I'd make it part of the record. She states as follows. Dear Mayor Stafford and Common Council, I am unable to attend the public hearing tonight, but I'm sending my support to zone change the property located on the southwest corner of Oneida and South 7th Street from C1 to C2 Commercial. My family has lived on the corner of Oneida and North 7th since the mid-40s. There's been a building across from our home my whole, I'm sorry, there's been a business across from our home my whole life. The closing of Fulton Builders a few years ago was a great loss to this community. In this time of economic ups and downs, can we really afford not to bring in new businesses? I feel confident that Wilson Farms would be a good business for this community and that they would follow appropriate guidelines to assure the safety of the neighborhood. So I would submit these for the record. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. This should probably be read out loud and make part of the record too. Yes, I can. Joe's got it. Yeah, you have a bunch of them. I got the four. We better. Okay. If they're all done. <clears throat> it, at this point, uh, I have received four pieces of correspondence that uh, I will read into the record and uh, make it a part hereof. The first one uh, is a letter to Alderman Woodward from Alice Sullivan. She resides at 603 Cayuga Street. I will not be able to attend the next council meeting regarding the Wilson coming to Fulton. I would like to go on record against this company's plans to build a store on Oneida Street at 7th Street or any place on Oneida Street. The next letter is from Patricia Ives, 615 Cayuga Street. Dear Mayor Stafford, I am against the proposed Wilson Farms on Oneida Street because it is directly behind my house. The demolition of the buildings on the property, on the property line will destroy the plantings also on the property line, which create my tiny woodland sanctuary. I expect increased exhaust fumes, noise, and flooding, along with the criminal element which these type of stores attract. The possible loss of morbidos is very disturbing. I cannot imagine being without the store and its friendly employees only half a block away. Wilton Farms has caused me much anguish as my roots are deep and I wish to remain here. Please consider the broader view of this project rather than just the financial aspect. We will truly gain more than we lose. P.S. We need Morbido's free shopper and delivery service to senior citizens. <coughs> the next letter is from Mary Jane and Jack McGraw. We as life residents of the city of Fulton are against the rezoning of the Oneida Street area for the purpose of building Wilson's Farms convenience store and gas station. We think that you are going to end up losing two locally owned businesses in the proposed area for the sake of a larger foreign owned company such as Wilson's Farms who require special zoning. If they want to build another Wilson Farms, let them put it in a district already zoned for such a business. Take a look at the amount of employees that will be affected. When I go into Wilson Farms on West Broadway, the most employees I see is about two or three at, it, at one time. When I go to the Morbido store on Cayuga Street, I see six to eight employees at one time. When employees are affected, they move on the they move on the jobs outside the city and take their money with them. And the last is a letter that I received from Henry Hudson, president of Hudson's Dairy. Dear Mayor Stafford, as a longtime area business owner, I am writing this letter to inform you that I oppose the pending zone change that would allow a Wilson Farms to be built on a Street. 
Yeah. I firmly believe that this proposed convenience store will not bring in any new business to Fulton. Instead, it will take revenue and jobs away from existing nearby stores, including one that has been family-run concern, like my business. In fact, the zone change may have an impact on my business. I currently provide a variety of dairy products to two stores within blocks of the propo proposed Wilson Farms. If the new store, which is owned by a corporation located outside of Fulton area, is built, it will sell milk products provided through their own distributor. However, I won't be the only longtime business affected by this new convenience store. The two stores two nearby stores, I fear, will also likely lose business. I also don't believe, as some have said, that the location of the new store will bring new shoppers to Fulton. Oneida Street is not one of the city's major roads used by visitors that pass through the city. It's also been suggested that the new Wilson Farms will provide more jobs for our community. This too is not true. I believe that instead of creating new jobs, there will be a shift in employment, where already employed local workers will leave their current jobs to work at Wilson Farms. As you can see, I do not support the proposed zone change for sound reasons. Unfortunately, I will be out of town and unable to attend the Common Council meeting when this item is on the agenda. I sincerely hope you and the members of the council will give serious thought to how your vote will impact several longtime businesses several local long-time businesses and current taxpayers. Thank you for your time. If you have any follow-up questions of this letter, please feel free to call my son. Those are the letters that I received. Now I will open the floor for comments from the audience. Please come forward to the mic, state your name and address. Your Honor, members of the council, my name is Ruth Berry, and I live at 63 South 5th Street. And it is a great tragedy that we lost Fulton Builders. I went there all the time. They helped me all the time. The paint wouldn't be peeling on my house if the painter had used their paint. It was a tragedy to lose them. But I don't want to have two tragedies. I need Marabitos there. They are within walking distance. They have been in our community a lot longer than 20 years. And the previous speakers talked about the commitment of, of TOPS to our community. I will agree that Wilson Farms serves delicious coffee. My husband loves it. But I personally boycott tops. They have too many rules. They won't let me buy my groceries with a check and a picture ID, New York State picture ID. I have to have a certain kind of card. They won't let my friend cash her checks unless she has two kinds of cards. That's annoying. I don't shop there. I don't get the feelings that they care about us. Mirbitos does. I don't know how to fix stores going out of business in the whole great scheme of things. But we already have a Wilson Farms. We already have a Tops. Do we have to have lots of them? Or lots of Wilson Farms? I don't think it's fair. Our local businessmen are precious. We lost one, I'm sorry. I don't know how to fix that. I don't want to lose another one. And I need them. I walk to top, or walk to Mirbitos, not to tops. Walk there. There's a whole lot of other people in my same position. So I feel that this would not be a good idea. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening, Mayor and members of the Common Council. Uh, my name is Ed Vayner. I reside in the town of Granby. 
but I'm one of the developers of Water Tower Hill, which is the neighborhood uh, of the project uh, under question here tonight. <coughs> I'm here tonight not as a, as a neighbor, uh, but as um, a member of the board, a new member of the board of the Greater Fulton Chamber of Commerce. And the Chamber of Commerce uh, is uh, in favor of this project, uh, totally in favor of this project. <coughs> I'm also here as a member of the, or as the chairman of the uh, city marketing committee. Now, we haven't gotten uh, uh, an awful lot of notoriety out there, but <coughs> we've worked with um, actually two members of the common council are on the marketing committee, and we've worked to go out and reach out into the central New York area to bring new business to Fulton. Primarily new retail business, but also uh, small industry and, uh, and that type of business. <coughs> um, We've developed some, through the good graces of the city, some marketing materials to attract uh, business to the city. Uh, most recently, we've run some advertising and in business publications throughout the central New York area to attract business to the city. This, uh, we believe, is an economic development question. It's a question of investment. It's a question of jobs. It's a question of bringing new uh, business to the city. I think. I, I feel for the Marbitos. I know the Marbitos well. I am a customer of theirs. I frequently stop at their store. Um, I, I think that if the council or any other legislative body gets into questions of competition, uh, they're misserving the people of the community. Um, do we keep out uh, Wilson Farms because of a nearby market? Do we keep out a shoe store because of Cortini's? Do we keep out another quality restaurant because of the lock or because of uh, uh, other restaurants in the city. Um, I don't think those are decisions that the council should be making. The issue here is purely an issue of zoning. Uh, you have a commercial zone, you have a business that, uh, uh, a former business that uh, is long established at that site, a business that ran heavy trucks, a business that ran Toll motors, I believe, in the backyard there. Uh, you've got a business that has gone out of business, a uh, uh, property that is now uh, abandoned and uh, probably will end up uh, uh, as a property of the city. Now you can go and you can hold it for a number of years. Uh, you can go and you can demolish it. You can go and you can offer the property for sale. Um, those are all alternatives. But to stop competition, I think you're doing uh, uh, the people a disservice. You're doing the business community a disservice. You know, <clears throat> we're not in the best of economic times uh, here in Fulton. We're not in the best of economic times here in central New York. Uh, things are difficult. I just heard tonight that uh, one of our major industries here is requiring, is asking their people to uh, uh, take uh, uh, benefits away so they can stay in business. Now, this isn't generally known, but you know we know that Owens Brockway is closed. We know that <coughs> other industries have moved out of town. Uh, we know that other industries are, have been taken over by foreign companies. So I don't think we should be afraid of a foreign company coming in. Uh, Royal A. Hold is a company that's uh, traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, I'm not here representing uh, A. Hold or representing Topps or representing Wilson Farms, but. Uh, from an economic development standpoint, I think you can do nothing else but approve this, uh, this zone change. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Catherine Mosier, 771 South 1st Street. I'm not a neighbor of this area, the proposed site. Uh, I have an interest, I'm a customer of the Mirabita grocery store, and I oppose changing the zoning. And I disagree that this is simply a question of changing the zoning. Fulton is not a zone. Fulton is a community of people. And what makes a community? It's people supporting each other. I have a friend who is in the senior building at Pathfinder Courts. 
She doesn't get out, but her groceries come every week. And she looks forward to the groceries, yes. But she looks forward very much to the individual who brings those groceries. And I know that Mayor Beatles delivers groceries to Pathfinder Courts once a week, the senior building. They, they offer also the mills. They deliver groceries there and also to Towpath, to our senior citizens. And we have to value the people in our community. Fulton is not a zone, it's a community. Also, I'd like to suggest that the hours, six o'clock to midnight, we have working families living around the proposed site. There is going to be exhaust, there, is go there are going to be car doors slamming, motors running, street congestion. Now, I'm aware of the fact that Oneida Street headed west. There can be congestion there going down the hill toward 481. Now we're talking about tankers. Wilson Farms will have to be serviced. We know there are alternate sites in the community. So I am very much against the zone change. We are a community of people. Fulton is not a zone. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Common Council. My name is Bill Summers. I live at 2079 State Route 48, and I'm retired. Uh, I understand that you've got your mind all made up, Mr. Lincoln, that you had a letter on the internet that you said a, you were going a to. Letter, a letter on the internet? You said you were going to sue if the mayor votes. Well, now that you do Who are bring, you suing? Who now, are you suing? Wait a second, Mr. Summers. Now that you do bring it up, and I was going to bring it up a little later, there's a local law, okay, that's subject to public mandatory referendum, okay? This is New York State Municipal Home Rule Law, okay? Under item B, in the case of a city, town, village changes the membership or composition of the legislative body or increases or decreases the number of votes of which any number is entitled to, you have to have a public referendum. So if the mayor voted tonight, it would be illegal. So if it was a 3-3 three, three tie. You, and another thing, uh, how come you don't listen to your constituents? You don't. You had yeah, I got, all made up. You know you what? I got, I got six tonight? calls today. And you know where they all came from? Bodie's Tavern. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I don't know Bodie's Tavern. <laughs> That's where they came I from because I called, right, called that, the number back. <laughs> that is not relevant to this whatsoever. I'm retired. You had your mind all made up before you come here tonight, right? It's a public hearing. I'm looking for public comment. That's what, our city attorney, that's what our city attorney Did told us that we had to up or not? That's what our city attorney told us that we had to do. That's what I told the people that called from Bodies today. I said, come to the public hearing. Who called from Bodies? I don't know who it was. They didn't tell you who I they could, were? No, but I can give you the number. Well, I don't need the number. I don't think that'll be necessary. <laughs> Mr. Summers, do you have any more input? Anyone else have anything to speak uh, on this issue? Apparently <clears throat> not. Hi, I'm Barb Mulvey. I live at 615 Utica Street which is about a block and a half from this proposed site. I also loved Fulton Builder Supply, and I, I know the Collins family, and I'm sorry for their, their business going out of business, but I am very much against this project. If you listen to Wilson Farms, it sounds like our neighborhood is missing something terrible, that we've been living there for 30 years not knowing what's missing, and they're ready to give it to us. I can't figure out what that is. If they go in there, I've heard that that land is higher than the surrounding land. Now, I don't know about any of you guys. Maybe you guys don't ever make mistakes, but sometimes when we fill our gas tank, we spill some. I know some people buy oil and they spill some. I know that people spill antifreeze. It may not be a lot, a little here, a little there, 
but when it rains, it's gonna end up in those people's backyards. Also, this place is gonna be open from 6 a.m. until midnight. We already have teenagers wandering the streets. They're gonna be able to buy beer any time of the day or night. They're gonna be wandering the streets through our neighborhoods in groups. In the middle of the summer, it's gonna be terrible. They're gonna be buying convenience things, soda pop, they're gonna be buying potato chips and stuff, and all that's gonna be tossed because they won't wanna carry that home. It'll be too much of a bother to put it in their pocket or carry it with them. We're gonna to have to deal with that mess. We're gonna to have to deal with the noise of them coming and going. We're gonna to have, to, the people who live directly near that property is gonna to have to deal with the lights of the cars as they go by and people honking at each other who are angry with each other and people getting ticked off at each other. The Wilson's farm across the way had a big fight over there a while ago. My sister-in-law lives down near Elmira. They have a lot of Wilson's farms down there and they get robbed regularly down there. All of these things are gonna be bad for our neighborhood. Now, there also been this threat that if you guys don't propose this and Wilson Farms doesn't go in there, that the city's gonna get stuck with that property because of the taxes. I would ask you guys to be very generous and to forgive the taxes. Don't take over the property. I thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. I'm going to pull this down just Please. a minute. Please. <laughs> I'm Cindy Payne, and I'm here on behalf of the Greater Fulton Chamber of Commerce. I am immediate past chairman of the board, and I would like to say on behalf of the Greater Fulton Chamber of Commerce, I'm here tonight to express a support for this project. The chamber's position is to welcome business to the community. We are an organization that actively solicits new businesses to come to this area. If the chamber is going to be successful in attracting new business to the area, then we must do all that can be done to facilitate businesses that are looking to locate here. While we certainly can understand some of the concerns expressed here tonight, the chamber believes that every business deserves a chance to succeed. There is no guarantee that this project will be successful at that location. There is no guarantee that any of us will be in business in the future. We must tend to our own houses in that regard. However, they have completed extensive studies and do not lightly go into these situations. The fact that they continue to pursue this location indicates their strong belief in this community and strong belief in their probability of success. We believe that if Fulton is going to be successful in attracting new businesses, then Fulton needs to welcome new businesses with open arms rather than present obstacles which are discouraging to business. Another key point I would like to make is that by expanding the business base, we enhance the area's overall quality of life. A business locating on the site under consideration will generate dollars. It will generate dollars from property taxes, school taxes, county taxes, as well as sales taxes for the city. It will also generate monies in the form of employees' salaries. Those employees are likely to be local residents who are in need of jobs. The money the employees make will likely find its way right back into our local economy. <coughs> In closing, let me reaffirm the Chamber's support of this business's request for a zone change from C1 to C2. As commercial businesses have existed on that corner for many, many years and have been good neighbors to those who live in the surrounding neighborhood, so will Wilson Farms be a benefit to the neighborhood, the city, and the community as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Alan Mulvey, I live at 615 Utica Street. And I've lived in this neighborhood for 30 years. Right now there's so much smoke and mirrors in this room that it's hard to tell what's going on. People talk about money coming in. Well, golly gee, last time we were here, these people said that they didn't want an alternate location because they wanted to be in a more residential place because they cater to walk-ins. This isn't people coming from out, out of town to come into town to spend their money and give us sales tax, walk-ins. What that's going to do, it just means that the same tax is going to be collected at a different location. No new tax, just a different collection point. People talk about competition. Well, gee, I think it's strange that they're picking a spot where there are two other stores within two blocks, and if those two stores go down the tubes, 
guess who the only closest grocery store is going to be? It's going to be Tops, a mile away. This isn't about money. I said this the last time we had this meeting, the last time when they were turned down. I don't know how many times we have to have the same meeting over and over again. It's not about money. It's about the character of a neighborhood and about the character of the people involved. We can see the character of the local business people we deal with. The local business people provide free shopping and free delivery <coughs> to the elderly people in our community. The local business people accept personal checks in payment. The local business people cash checks for people who need some cash. The local business people have lived here themselves and know the people around here and are loved by the people around here. The local business people care about the people in their community. As far as the character of the people from Wilson Farms, well, we can see that very clearly. Last time there were very thinly veiled threats of how they're gonna stick it to the city for the cost of demolition if you don't give them this variance. Now today there are threats that if you don't give them this variance, they're gonna come in in a year or so from now and maybe really pounce on the competition and put them out. This is about character. We don't need barracudas in our neighborhood doing business. I don't care how fancy their place of business is. I don't care how nice they dress. We need people with character. People who represent the people of our city who are good people. People who care about the people in our city and not about the cash flow. It's about character. The character of the people and the character of the neighborhood. <coughs> I have a lot more to say, but I think I'd better not. And as far as this goes, I'm very upset about the way this has been handled. It was turned down by the zoning board. It was turned down at the last public hearing. Now we have another public hearing, and we have some strange manipulation of the votes. I don't know what's going on here, but I don't like it. And I know I'm gonna remember all this when election time comes around. Because we need people of character, not only as business people in our area, but we need people of character for our public officials. Character, not cash flow. Thank you. Thank you. down just a little bit there I have a few issues that uh, some of them have been covered uh, I noticed that filling up at a gas station that there's a health warning hanging above the pumps we have counted 14 children under the age of 10 that live in the 600 block of Oneida Street alone seven of them are under the age of two I would like to know what kind of health issues would be facing the generation of these, this community. It's a mostly quiet residential neighborhood with a large population of children of all ages. I ask concern about the clientele that will be going to the establishment. What kind of impact is that going to be on our children? Another major concern is our lack of drainage. Every time we have a rainstorm, three quarters of that road is flooded, which spills into our yards, into our cellars, and everything else. The drainage cannot hold the water. It's going to be washing the contaminants from the gas station that the public spills into our yards and our houses. Um, it was determined the last time the addition of Wilson Farms was not going to really bring in more population to shop here in the community, but disperse what we had. I, however, feel that it's going to take away from our local small businesses that live, pay taxes, and are raising their families right here in the community. I don't feel we should be giving our business to a large corporation. I think we should be supporting our small businesses. I realize the property has been commercial property since the turn of the century, but they've always conformed to our residential neighborhood. 
We had the evenings at nighttime where the businesses were closed so we could enjoy our properties. I've lived in that area since 1968. So I realize, you know, we have too many small children just in that one block that I know of. They, we really don't, it's not the ideal solution for our neighborhood. And one of the um, health warnings here is long time exposure to the vapors has caused cancer in laboratory animals. And these are visible right above gas pumps at your local gas stations. So therefore, I am opposed to Wilson Farms. Okay. What was your name again, please? Melanie Pitcher. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Carol Rutledge, City of Fulton Community Development Agency. The City of Fulton Community Development Agency is the economic development entity for the city, and I offer the following observations. However, I'd also like to note that these comments are not necessarily going to reflect the views of the members of the board of the City of Fulton Community Development Agency, since the board is the common council of the City of Fulton. Thank you for that. Wilson Farms has not submitted a loan package to the <coughs> CDA, nor is this location within the city's economic development zone. The developer will not be eligible for any benefits offered through EDZ, yet they will still make a substantial investment in the community. I believe the figure was a million dollars. Several of the aldermen had mentioned an alternative for the site as resi residential development. Uh, Fulton Builders has been zoned C1 and has operated a, as a commercial business for over 50 years. A zone change would in fact be required for new housing construction. In 1994, Fulton Community Revitalization Corporation developed eight single family homes at Copper Beach, each selling for $60,000, with $15,000 provided as a grant to underwrite the selling price for a mortgage of $45,000. The last unit was just sold in December of 2000. In discussion with Mike uh, Egan today, the superintendent of schools, Phillip Street School site has been available on the market since 1995, and it's a very desirable res residential site suitable for new construction. However, the city building permit records for new construction, residential building permits, uh, for 1999 show zero building permits issued and for 2000, one <coughs> building permit issued. If this site remains unsold, as Dennis mentioned, it's quite reasonable to assume that this property will end up in the hands of the city through a tax foreclosure proceeding with the city responsible for asbestos, lead-based paint abatement, and demolition costs. Uh, many of you will recall the last gift that the city had was the former YMCA for a dollar. I'd like to mention that while we secured 150000 in HUD grant funding, the total cost for asbestos abatement, engineering, and demolition was $219,821, almost $70,000 over the available grant funding. And while demolition is certainly an eligible cost under the CDBG program, uh, that money was provided as a grant to the city to underwrite the costs from the revolving loan fund, and it was never recaptured, and it will never be available, obviously, for loaning again. Wilson Farms on West Broadway initially projected five full-time employees, and as of January 2000, they had actually created eight. That's per their annual, their EDZ annual business report. Um, their 2000 numbers are not yet available for us. While there's no way to project accurate sales tax revenues for Wilson Farms, their EDZ application denoted annual sales projections of 1.5 million. The Fulton tax assessor, Diane Moore, indicates the city could expect the access assessment for a Wilson Farms type development to be at least $500,000. The existing Wilson Farms is assessed at $707,000. Uh, Fulton Builders is currently assessed at 330. However, the property was listed for sale at 229. Vacant buildings are always a concern to the community as the opportunity for vandalism and particularly a fire is greater the longer the structure remains vacant. I believe the mayor will remember the Kamenak building as a perfect example. The old YMCA building had been vandalized a number of times prior to demolition and was particularly dangerous because there happened to be an empty swimming pool remaining in the building and obviously there were no lights on. Um, a fire in a very old wooden structure can spread very quickly, threatening many adjoining properties. <coughs> 
I support the Fulton Planning Commission member Ken Patrick's concern about reasonable expectation for the site as there has been very little interest in new residential construction in the city and it is reasonable to assume the building will be sold for commercial rather than residential use. Mr. Patrick also indicated that if approved, Wilson Farms would still be required to complete the site plan review process through the Fulton Planning Commission. Neighbors with concerns about traffic, lighting, screening, ingress, egress will be able to voice their concern to the Fulton Planning Commission through the site plan review process. If a commercial entity purchases the building, makes no changes to the structure, they can literally go in there, open the door and start business with no additional review or approval process. Neighbors will have some control through site plan review, but none if the building is opened and becomes operational as it exists. Mr. Patrick also notes the existing C1 zoning designation allows for limited commercial use abutting a residential district for the following uses. Um, and I'll just point out a few. Um, a church or other place of worship, religious education center, which I would assume would be tax exempt, a social club or lodge, a restaurant slash eating and or a drinking establishment. In, in completion, I would say, let's continue to send a positive mes message to the potential developers of this world, the Steve Thomases. Fulton has always welcomed new business development, and I hope we'll continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your Honor. Yes. Uh, would it be proper for me to say something at this point? Yes. I'll try to keep it short. By all means. Mm -hmm. um, I listened to what Carol said just now, and I've listened to this tonight really close. And what she says is partially true. Uh, we haven't attracted a lot of single family homes because nobody wants to live in our city because our neighborhoods have went down. They've went downhill. And I don't ever remember since 1982, since I got on this council, when the neighborhood in the United Street and Cuyahoga Street area encroached on the businesses where Fulton Builders was. In fact, they expanded and the zoning was changed to expand that area. Fulton Builders was a good business and we'll miss it. As we did our downtown, look at it. I mean, over the years, what we had and what we have now, times change. But when you look at neighborhoods, do we improve the character of our neighborhoods by saying we're not going to take it over and, and go back to residential? I mean, we encourage through your agency in the state of New York to bring tons of, of, of rental units in this town, and they didn't help the character of our neighborhoods. They made people who were professionals that we wanted to come here not want to live here. Now, I'm having a hard time understanding how anybody's going to want to live in an area when this council and me and everyone else is not willing to take our neighborhoods and make them neighborhoods again. There is no reason for somebody to want to come here in a single family home and raise small children. Where do we start? Everybody that wants to do something here don't live here. And everybody that lives here, we say, well, you know, we're going to raise your taxes if you don't do this. And that's just what we're saying. Where do we stop? We took the Kamenau building. It was a pig and a poke. But we did it, and we all fucked up to it, and we, we handled it financially, and now we can make it more productive. I think we could do that. What would be the harm if the city ended up with that and the young families moved in there? Would it cost us? Sure it would. And so now we have people, just about everybody, with the exception of one person, the three letters that the mayor read about tonight, and some of the people I see here tonight are longtime members of our community, senior citizens. They're the anchors around that area. And when they're gone, what do we do? We take their homes and turn them into business? Or do we make four family apartments out of them so nobody else wants to live here? That's what we're talking about. Are the ones that litter the street with garbage? Are the ones that make us have to hire ten, five or ten uh, people in the code enforcement that, that that we try to balance between the the itinerants of this city and the people that are anchors here? Somewhere along the line, we got to bite the bullet, and uh, I've 
I understand your feeling, Carol. It's all financial, and I'm concerned about a financial too. I work at a major industry that we're talking about that we're that's teetering, literally. And I own a home here. I, I want to pay taxes. My children live here, but I think sooner or later we got to say, where does the council? What this is a defining issue for this council. What do you think of your neighborhoods? What do you want to do with them? You want to keep turning them into something where people don't want to live? That's what you're doing. We did it. We did it with uh, 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 probably 15 years ago. We we went to the state and said, "Gee, we don't get. We haven't got federal money. We got a bunch of people sitting over in the in our building in the community development agency. Maybe we better get more HUD so we can keep the jobs here." And what happened? We had to go out and hire a bunch of of people in code department because we can't even keep up with the garbage. The people, don't, we, they don't live here, they don't care. They're here today, going tomorrow. Where do you draw the line? Who cares about the town that we live in? Is everything money? Don't we care about this? those people that live here? I look out here tonight and see a bunch of them. I heard the letters from three of them, and I, you, you need to see the human side. Those people that wrote those letters weren't, didn't come down here because they didn't think it was important. One of them couldn't come here. Well, two of them couldn't come here. One for age and one for physical disability. These are the places they're locked to. And it should be important to us. Because if, they're, if Wilson Farmers is thinking about putting a place somewhere else, maybe Bob, it's over by you. And you never had the problem that I had in the sixth ward or Holly had in the fifth ward, but you're uh, familiar with them because you lived here a good part of your life. So, Carol, I think the world of you and you've worked close with me and I understand where you're coming from, but uh, people are important. They really are. And money is too, but so are the people because their homes are, who's going to want to buy their homes? Who cares, right? We didn't encroach on the businesses in the neighborhoods. They encroached on us. The mayor just put me on a committee where we're going to try to define where our master plan for the city, and I would hope that we could look at it and have places where people can live and raise families and places where only businesses can go, and it stops there. If every time somebody holds out a, a quarter to us and says, you better change the zone or you're going to lose this, then we're in trouble. We're going to keep up with the same. The, most of these people don't live here. They don't want to live here. Half of the ones that spoke tonight in favor of it don't live here, and they probably wouldn't. I don't blame them. <laughs> um, Kathy Trowbridge, I can't tell you how you inspire me all the time, but this is exactly what an alderman goes through every single time an issue comes back. And what Ron says is passionate. I was a neighborhood pr preservationist. I believed in the heart of what Ron's saying. And yet we struggle with the good ideas of the CDA that we serve and the financial needs of this community. But I do agree. I can't sell my house in the Fifth Ward. I think Mirabito's has the best meat in town, and I don't care what grocery store you bring in here. These are the things we struggle with. And what got us here, and what is more bothersome, and why I came down here, because I hate being the alderman that comes in, and I've stayed away, you don't want to say this, but what John Lincoln has talked about, the controversy that's been in the paper has been upsetting, is this 50-50 vote. Three votes for the Wilson's Farm wouldn't have even been an issue to us. Three against. No tiebreaker. That is a dilemma in our, in our, right here in the city. But what I say to that is hooray for a tiebreaker. That means no, and no means we've got to step back, as Mr. Woodward said. There was a problem. Whatever the reasons are, no does not shut down the city. A tie does not shut down the city. A tie makes aldermen step back and work and see what's best for their community. And it is a struggle every day. We want stores to come in here. We want businesses to come in here. But nobody will buy a home. Nobody will build homes in this community. It is getting that bad. Code enforcement is getting bad. The streets are starting to fall apart again. And I don't mean that negatively. I'm saying we have hard choices to make. So of course we need money to fix the streets. Of course. But pretty soon, all these good people will not live in this community. I wanted to move my grandmother, who's 92, to Fulton. 
because of Mirabito's, because I said, Graham, if I couldn't be there, that is such a great service. And Mr. Thompson, you represent the people of Topath Towers. There's no better service in this city than what people that belong to the city bring to the city. I, I don't say that the Tops people or the Wilson's Farm people are mean and they want to come in. Of course they want no, competition. That's a great spot. But there's other spots. But the need, the one argument I heard is a need for a store there flies in the face. Mirabito's meets our needs. And the Tops Market does come along to bus people from Topat. What do we need it for? I don't understand that argument. But what I'm saying is just so people understand, because I sit here and it brings all those memories up of sitting in that alderman chair, you want to do what's right for this city. And every one of you do, I, I know you do. And when there's a 3-3 tie, the tie means no, and that means that either the aldermen that were for it didn't fight hard enough, or the aldermen that were against it didn't fight hard enough. That means you're a better alderman if you get back together. And the mayor is part of the Common Council, and the mayor has everything at his disposal to say, I'm going to bring in the attorneys, I'm going to bring in the department heads, I'm going to bring in the CDA, and all the business people, and I'm going to prove and I'm going to make my case that either Mirabito's is more important or Wilson's farm is more important. He has all that at his disposal. So to give away, for an alderman to give away the power of his vote so that it's easy for a mayor, it's a tiebreaker. What if three of you get in a room and say, I'm not going to vote for that issue. It's a hot issue. Let the mayor be stuck with it. Let him hang his hat. You know how hard that would be, Mayor Stafford, because you as yourself sit at a desk and read pros and cons, and your heart pulls for each one of those. You have a responsibility to the taxpayer, and you have a responsibility to the good people of this community. And it's hard. You've got to listen <coughs> to them. So I'm saying I, I don't want to take a position. Collins family was a good business. That was a family business. It catered to us. It helped us with the colors of our paints. That's what we were fighting for with Mirabito's. Very difficult decision, but my what bothers me tonight is there could be a vote, and it could be three, and it could be three. I have I never asked any of you how you're gonna vote on this, but I do I do not understand or I'd like if there is a, a, a vote to be broken. I think the community should study that a little bit harder and see more of the charter language that we had to look at because I think if it is, it has to go up for referendum or if it's just a matter of wording, I really think we have to think about that because I think aldermen have to get together because a 3-3 vote before told me that it really isn't studied and either they have to give more information or more convincing to the community or they have to go to a different spot or the people that are from Mirabitos have to come in more force. But I don't want to see a mayor breaking a vote for three aldermen because when that three al those three aldermen voted a tie vote, no meant no, and no meant that it really wasn't done well, and there's too many questions for this community to say that we can feel comfortable making either decision. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Devin Delpas again uh, from Laker Development Group. Um, I think one of the things that has been um, fairly significant uh, theme this evening is uh, is not one necessarily of zone change, whether or not gasoline makes sense, it's purely whether or not it's going to impact a local business that exists, Mirabitos. <coughs> um, what I've also heard is an extremely strong and very uh, loyal following on the part of folks for Mirabitos. They deliver, they have, uh, they have a butcher shop, they have very strong support. With that strong support, businesses don't go away. End of story. Mirabito's is going to be there. We actually were offered a parcel of property that Mirabito's owns. They offered to sell it to us in the similar area, but it was turned down because it didn't make sense for us. Mirabito's has a strong support. Don't forget that. A lot of these folks here tonight are here because of their strong support for Mirabito's and will continue to shop at Mirabito's. What you're going to see with this development is you're going to see five buildings that are deteriorating, currently a fire hazard, go away. And you're going to see a new development happen that's going to improve the neighborhood as opposed to what's there now on that corner. You're going to see green area. You're going to see it maintained at a very high standard by a company that has a long-term commitment to the area. And I think those are very important factors to consider. 
We're not saying that Mayor Vito's <coughs> going to go out of business. I don't think you can say that when you're seeing support like that here. It's not an either or thing, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would care to speak on this? <coughs> Tom Mayor Vito. Uh, I want first of all, I want to thank everybody here that is back me on this, and I want to speak in two lights. First of all, as a, as a business owner there, yes, I do have the meat department, I do have the delivery, but I also have a convenience store. Okay? I need that convenience store business to keep the rest of it going. Yes, I have some loyal people, but, but there are people who aren't loyal who are going to take that. And they're coming in there to target that area. Or they're, they're bound to take some away. I need that business to keep on going. Enough said on that. I also, I'm a property owner in the area, and I see no way where a gas station is going to improve the property. Do you want to live next to a gas station? Would you want to live next to a gas station? No, I don't think so. <coughs> they, as much as said, they're looking for other areas in the city. They might want to go up near Nestle or Maple Ave or something like that, or over on the west side. Uh, you got to think about that. Uh, these people here do not want that in their neighborhood. They do not want a gas station there. Listen to them. Okay? Give them to them now. You know, they need to come in the mirror the next. And you're, you're setting a precedent. Also, your planning commission has turned this idea down. Listen to them as well. You want a master plan for the city. Let it begin. Okay. And Vice Judge Gold, if I do go out, let it begin. Thank you. Thank you. Another empty voting. Anyone else? If I may, I know my fuel presentation was very dry. I'll be extremely brief. First of all, I want to just echo some of the comments from uh, Mr. Delpas. I, I agree, Mr. Mr. Mirbuto, I think has a fantastic business, as is evidenced here by his support. Uh, there were a couple things that I just wanted to make sure that I clarified. One was uh, it was not a threat in regards to having a bigger store. It would, actually was in direct response to a question the board had posed to me last time, and that was, could you survive on this site without gasoline? And the initial response was, internally, when we looked at it, absolutely not, even if the land was free. The recent change in where we might be headed as a company is to have another offering, which I think would more directly compete with Mirabito, and all I was doing was addressing a response. I, we do not know how to run them profitably yet. We haven't learned the business yet. It may not be an option for this location. It may not even be an option for me in upstate New York. But I was still addressing a question, and at the information I have now, it is a possibility in the future. Uh, the only other clarification was um, from Carol Rutledge had a report showing that there are eight full-time employees in the report. Uh, at our existing Wilson Farms, and earlier I had stated that we would employ about 20 people. I just wanted to clarify that that includes part-timers. So if anyone picked up on the difference between number of employees, that would be the difference. I, I have a question. Uh, a couple of people brought up the possibility of, of uh, spills, oil, oh, yes. uh, gasoline from the customers that, uh, that would get off the property. Yes, yeah, so let, let me address that uh, in two ways, because I, I think there were two separate and distinct issues. One was customers driving up and antifreeze, oil, stuff spilling from the car that has nothing to do with the gasoline. I would, I would suggest that that would be the same whether we have gasoline or not, and therefore would not be an issue in front of the board. It would be part of the planning board with oil separators and how we handle the, the property. Um, that, as we would with any retail use there without gasoline. The other issue, though, however, is specific to the gasoline. People fill up with their nozzle. And as we all know, there are a couple of drips of gasoline, uh, or you can have a couple of drips of gasoline. The gasoline does evaporate into the air. If there ever were enough to where uh, there would be a, uh, a spill, of course, we have uh, uh, 
procedures in place with a spill kit and other things, but for the but for the small area around the tanks, I mean around the uh, uh, pumps, there is a positive barrier. It's a concrete, <coughs> the, the island mat is a concrete mat and it has grooves put in it and a positive barrier around it. So if ever there were any little bit of, of spill, even if rainwater were to wash uh, a little bit of gasoline down, it stays in that positive barrier and evaporates. Okay. Now, in the uh, situation with having to have a, uh, uh, a sign up, there are, I guess there are signs at gas pumps. Uh, Ms. Pitcher, I believe, had that. Uh, a sign that says constant inhalation of the vapors has been known to cause cancer. What? The, the vapors don't leave the site. So I, I, I don't think that's an issue beyond uh, the gasoline industry in terms of filling up. It, it, the vapors don't leave from the gas pumps to the neighbors. In fact, there's a, a fire code, and I wish I brought it, but uh, certainly it could be researched uh, uh, from, by the board. But you have uh, a vapor pipes as part of the tanks in case there ever were pressure buildup. There, it could, it could release uh, uh, pressure. And those vapors can be within, I think it's about 10 or 15 feet from a second story uh, building adjacent to it. So. The, the, the federal code says even the worst case scenario is still within 10 or 15 feet of, of, uh, uh, of, of a potential uh, hazard with, uh, with, with people next door. So clearly, we're, we're not anywhere near that uh, in, our, in, our, uh, in our site plan. Uh, and, and the issues of vapors at the pumps, I, I, I don't think, are an issue with, with the surrounding neighborhood. And earlier, I believe I heard you say that you might be able to be flexible with hours. Yes. There was, I, I heard a lot of concern tonight over hours six at night till midnight and, and I, disrupting the, uh, the neighborhood. The, uh, the, the coffee is an, a very important part of our business. It's, it's uh, what we uh, do best, I think, in, in many aspects uh, of our business. A coffee is, is, is one of our, our better signatures. So the 6 a.m. part is very important to us. The midnight is not. Uh, 10 p.m. becomes very important to us. 11 p.m. I think would be a happy uh, uh, medium, but uh, but midnight by no means is, is something that would prohibit. If, if you were to restrict us to say 10 p.m. or 11 p.m., I, I don't think it would it would prohibit us from being able to move forward. Do, does the company uh, work to uh, w with local law enforcement or, or local zoning to to keep? Uh, people from congregating on the property. There was some concern of young people congregating. Is a place for young people to congregate at night? Uh, yes, there, there always is a, uh, a, a balancing act between having too much light and too little light, more light, less of an opportunity people have to hang around. Um, of course, the more light in this particular location, the, the more of an impact on the neighbors. So, uh, we, we have enough where we, we think we're a deterrent, and of course, we, we, our policy is not to allow people to hang out at our location. I, I don't know what the situation is at Wilson Farms is here in town, if that is happening. If it has been a concern, I'd be happy to hear those comments, but... Uh, I but haven't heard complaints about that, okay. but just th this was one of the things that was brought up. And, and, and the comment about Elmira is actually news to me. I, if we're having the problems uh, that are that we're... Uh, suggested this evening, then th that is news to me. I, I, I do get notified on when we do have problem areas, and Elmira has not been on the list. So there may have been a couple of isolated incidents, but I'd be surprised if it's an ongoing concern. The existing situation, Mayor uh, Devin Delpas again, is, uh, is actually more conducive to um, congregation of folks than one with light and improved. I mean, it's dark. Kids could go and hang out. It's a great place to go and hang out if you're a kid. Nobody can see you. Um, but one of the points that I wanted to bring up with respect to the spill, um, the whole site, the whole paved area is all curbed. So it's important that, to know that all of that is contained as well, just for your information. Okay. Mayor, I have a question, please. Uh, I don't know uh, the Laker development. Yes, you know sir. what's your name? Uh, 
correct me on this, uh, you did mention that there was another Marbido site that you were looking at? Yes, sir. I, it was a property owned by Okay, Marbido's for the same purpose? Yes, sir. Okay, can you disclose that site? Um, Emory and th Route 3. Okay, okay. Yeah. thank you. You're welcome. And, uh, according to the map I have here, it is less than half a mile from uh, this site and from Mirabito's existing business. And in fact, would service the same neighborhood. Um, however, it's on the outskirts of the neighborhood and that goes against what our research department would like to see for, for servicing the needs. It gets away to the earlier comment, I forget who made it, about uh, foot traffic. Alan Mulvey, I'd just like to make a few comments about some of the things that they said about some of the things that we had said. For one thing, anybody who can convince an Oswegonian that they can control the wind is a hell of a salesman. <laughs> <laughs> to say that gasoline vapors will not escape from the premise is absolutely absurd. And I would like everyone on this council to just take a walk through the city and walk on the sidewalk past our existing gas stations and try to not smell gasoline. I don't think you'll be able to do it. As far as gasoline <coughs> being a non, being a zero residue product as far as its evaporation is concerned, that's an outright lie. Anybody who's ever spilled gasoline on their car knows that it leaves residue. Certainly gasoline is volatile and much of it evaporates, but it doesn't all evaporate. The additives in it do not evaporate. The additives are some of the more toxic components. Maybe every customer is only going to spill a few drops, but they're talking about being there for 20 years. And how many thousands of customers, or hundreds of thousands of customers multiplied over that time? How much of this toxic stuff is going to enter into our environment? How much of these fumes are not going to be allowed to blow into the neighbor's yards? Just think about some of the absurdities of things you've heard tonight, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is David Spencer. I live at 419 Seneca Street, and I'm here opposed to uh, the rezoning. And basically, I think it boils down to that we don't necessarily not want competition. I think it comes down to fair competition. And as uh, Mr. Marbido said, he does have a convenience store that probably brings in a, enough money for him to be able to offer those services that he does offer. And I think that in the long run, if he was to lose that uh, to the competition, that the community itself would lose a great deal. And I think we'd end up with one more gas station in Fulton and one less community, uh, one less uh, um, business that really uh, helps the community. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Poinier. I live at 830 Utica Street, and I won't be boring you with any more than what you've already heard. You're not going to make everybody happy. What you do have to do is listen to the community, listen to the voters, listen to the people that are concerned about this zoning change. I oppose it. I encourage anybody else that's here to come up. If you're for it, say you're for it. If you're opposing it, oppose it. Thank you. Thank you. No, I don't have anything else to say right now, but one of the ladies over here asked me to give the council uh, this print of a sign from one of the local gas station listing all the health hazards from the fumes and from the gasoline, etc. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would care to speak on this? Council, my name is Ken Collins. I do not own Fulton Village Supply. I own property adjacent to it. Um, we've heard a lot of good for Marbidos. People speak about, about Marbidos, but this is free enterprise system. Um, I don't believe a store there, a convenience store, would hurt Marbidos. It's more for gas. It's more for the person that comes in gets a cup of coffee, a pack of cigarettes, they're out. Get a paper, they're out. 
Um, I own property next to the buildings that are going to be torn down. I think it would be better for the city to have these torn down, or the, the developer to tear these down, than to have the city tear these down. I also know that Mr. Ives is here and he had a letter in the paper. If you go down and read the survey stakes, about a foot of his garage is on the property that was surveyed. And I think he has concern about that. Mr. Sullivan wrote a uh, letter to the city, um, to the mayor. That house is owned by Tom Marbido. I don't know. He's lived there for a lot of years. He's been a neighborhood, a good neighborhood person. But Tom Marbido does own that house. Um, there are still some funny questions that I haven't, can't answer in my own mind. But as far as bringing another business into the city, I think it would be good for the city. The buildings are not going to go away. Agway's falling down, that's not going to go away. Knights is falling down, that's not going to go away. There's going to be a lot of cost here. And if somebody will come in and take some of this cost away from us, I'm for it. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Russ Johnson. Uh, I kind of serve in a unique uh, perspective here. I serve, number one, as a, a former uh, resident of the neighborhood. There's Gussie there. I've like been there all my life. And what they Gussie's the queen of the neighborhood. Um, I also serve as the uh, legislator for the district uh, 25, for the county legislature. Ironically, my district is, uh, it, it breaks off in the middle of Oneida Street. <clears throat> However, I do have a concern. I remember being a child, and from my personal perspective, where I would go to Mr. Marbido's store uh, with my food stamps that my mom would give us. Gussie would always give me a cookie on my way to the store. Um, and I do empathize with the concern of business and then additional business and then more business competing with, with each other, but I respectfully disagree with any concept from any politician or any government official that we need to intervene with business. Business, as uh, Mr. Council eloquently said, is private enterprise. And for government to take a role one way or the other or to stay on one side or the other, that's certainly contrary to what government is for. Um, it's, it's been pretty clear, and I appreciate the comments and the response that I got from some of the aldermen in terms of my uh, letter that I sent back in the fall. Uh, it's pretty clear where I stand on this. I'm, I'm for growth. I'm for business growth. Um, I think it's good for the city. Um, I, I do uh, empathize, and I listen to Mr. Mulvey when, Mulvey when he talks about the concern of gas vapors. I know of no statistics. Maybe they're out there, but I know of no statistics where neighborhoods having gas stations um, have caused a significant health problem. Uh, Mr. Mulvey made later on might be able to shed some light on that. But we, 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 we've got a lot of things that we need to look at. I'm going to leave the, the danger and the police law enforcement aspect out of that, even though I do serve in the police department as well. I'll leave that to Chief Spawn because I'm sure that he's capable of talking about that. Uh, but from a legislator's perspective and, and a person who also lived in the neighborhood, I see no reason why we wouldn't want this to go through. The, the real issue here needs to be gasoline, and I've heard some of the speakers say that. I haven't been able to be here for everything because I also serve on the uh, board of directors for the regional market, which, by the way, in two months, fresh fruit and vegetables. Sort of Syracuse regional market. How did you move? <laughs> How did you move away? That's a good question. Let me address that. There has been some concern. Uh, the question was, why did I move away? Well, I outgrew the home that I lived in. I've never outgrown the neighborhood. Uh, my wife was pregnant with two children. We were, uh, she was pregnant for twins. We needed a much bigger home. Unfortunately, we lost our twins, but we had already made a commitment to the home. That's my neighborhood. I've been there all my life. I heard you were poor, and then you moved to the kitchen. Well, that's simply not true, sir. Mr. Ives, that's not true. I'm, I've been for this from, from day one. I think it's good for the community. It's, it's, it's going to be good for the bigger good, too. For the bigger good of this city, it's something that we certainly need to look into. And I would. I know you have a tough decision here, man, uh, but do it with your best conscience. Don't let the competition of business be the sole reason why you vote for or against this. It needs to be for the better good of the city. Thanks. Thank you. 
back by invitation only. <laughs> Since my name was mentioned by a previous speaker, I would like to comment on his comments. Uh, number one, I'm a police officer also, but I still live in the neighborhood. I didn't bail out. And I'm not planning on bailing out. And number two, the information I presented about the health hazards of gasoline was not my opinion, but the opinion, I believe, of the federal government of the United States, who requires these signs to be posted, and the state of New York. So I am merely pointing out things taken by judicial notice by the governing authorities of our land, that gasoline is toxic, that gasoline vapors are toxic. Thank you. Alderman Sherman, could, could you pass that back down here so that we can make everybody privy to what we had? Is that the one you're talking about? Yes. Yeah, the other two as well? Yeah. <laughs> the, the health warning that uh, is above a gas pump someplace and, and probably at all gas stations. It's a health warning. Harmful or fatal if swallowed? Yes. Long-term exposure to vapors has caused cancer in laboratory animals. Okay. Avoided prolonged breathing, avoid prolonged breathing of vapors. Keep face away from nozzle and gas tank. Keep away from eyes and skin. Never siphon by mouth. <laughs> Failure to use caution may cause serious injury or illness. Well, uh, I see this as being a prolonged, in prolonged proximity to these vapors. And I think people go and gas up their cars, and most of the gas stations today are self-service. I, I know that, that, that I do myself quite a bit. And it doesn't appear to be a problem. And those stations that have full service have people working there on a daily basis. And as long as you <laughs> avoid prolonged breathing of vapors, I, I don't see it as a problem. Yes, are some vapors going to get in the air? Yes. Are they going to dissipate? I, I think so. If it wasn't for if it was, yes, it is toxic, but if it was ex that bad, how could we use it? How could we pump it and, and use it in our vehicles if that's the case? But I just wanted everybody to know what this sign said. Now, anybody else care to speak on this? My name is Bob Collins, and I am the president of Fulton Builder Supply Company, Incorporated. And, um, I would like to start by saying that I have lived in the direct neighborhood of Fulton Builder Supply all my life. I'm 50 years old. For 25 years, I lived adjacent to the property. And 25 years ago, I became the um, president and the owner of Fulton Builder Supply Company. So I have lived in this neighborhood, and I have worked in this neighborhood for 50 years. And I know everyone that is here. And I think I even know them better than the aldermen might know them. And if we went around and started naming names, I would know their families, and I'd know their children, and I'd know their backgrounds. And I appreciate very much to see them come here tonight on such an important issue. I want to say first that if this was to go through, I certainly am still going to shop at Tom my videos. I am never not going to shop it there. And I have to come in now from town, probably drive, 10 miles to shop sometimes over to towns, but I'm not going to let that go. And I don't think anyone that's in this room is going to let that go. I also think that there are general concerns for gasoline. And I think that's something that I thought about too. But Fulton Builder Supply's position is, is basically this. I was in the community for 50 years. I'm not going to let the property go downhill any longer and, and not have something reasonably, respectfully good happen to it. Um, I can say without candor that yes, 
if there was a no vote, the zone change didn't go through, uh, probably, more than likely, the city will own this on back taxes. They know that, it's, it's not a threat, it's not meant as a threat. That leaves them responsible to develop it. <coughs> it's an easy way out for Fulton Builder Supply. On the other hand, Fulton Builder Supply has creditors. It, uh, it isn't bankrupt, as the paper called up and asked, are you bankrupt? No, we're not bankrupt. If we were to sell this property to someone who was respectful, we would probably come out of it breaking even. Fulton Builder Supply has no way of gaining either way. So I looked at it in that respect and said, what do I owe my neighbors? I owe my neighbors a business, because a business will go in there, that is probably safe, clean, and reasonable, and something that we have control over as a neighborhood. And we do have control over this. They're voting on the zone, but we can go back to the planning zone, planning board, and we can ask for our sidewalks and we can ask for the time of day that we want that place to close. And we can ask for it to be green again, like it really could be. So I say to you neighbors, I say, yes, it is a gas station. It's better than what is there now. It's better than what could be there. And it is something that there is a future in. I chose it as a responsible way. I hope that you as neighbors consider that while it is an inconvenience, and no one likes to live next to a neighbor, to a gas station. I think it's better than living next to a lumber yard. And that's about all I have to say. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, members of the committee, my name is Leah Haggerty, and I'm the broker owner of Century 21 here in Fulton. Um, I represent the Collins on the sale of this property. Um, I did want to talk to Mr. Woodward in respect to the possibility of rezoning because I think it's a very, um, it's reality. The current values in the area for the single family and the multi-families are, they range between forty and $60,000. And we would be grossly mistaken to think that if this commercial site was ever to be rezoned residential, that even if the lots were given away, that I, as a real estate broker or a real estate consultant, could ever encourage someone to build a new home there with the expensive building costs being as they are, seventy to $80,000 for a small 1,200 square foot ranch when they can pick a building lot, for example, in Tannery Village. And those lots go for $11,000. And they would be among homes between eighty and $180,000. So out of a fiduciary relationship to any client that I would have that would be building or any other real estate broker in the area, we'd have to lay out the prices and the risks. If you put an $80,000 house in a forty dollars to $60,000 neighborhood, or you can put your $80,000 house in an eighty dollars to $180,000 neighborhood. But as Carol Rutledge has pointed out, um, building permits in our area are very few and far between. So it's, it's, it's sad, but it's, it's reality. It's what's happening right now. Can I ask you a question? What makes it a forty to sixty thousand dollar neighborhood? Because that's the average price range in the area. Yeah, but why? What's different about well, there than Tannery Village? I think there's a few it, people in here that know. Who makes those decisions are the buyers, and it's a more sought after area. So it's being a more sought after area, it drives the prices higher. Um, <coughs> so it is a decision made by the buying public, you, me, and the rest of our community. Yeah, and they usually. Marketing committee for the city of Fulton, and I'm very confused at the. Con I'm very concerned because of the conflicting messages we're sending to other businesses and possibly relocations of industries in our area. The marketing committee has spent many volunteer hours and dollars focusing on bringing a new business to our area, and it seems that these efforts may be useless if, after we bring the business in, that our business finds closed doors instead of open minds. You know, I'm working also, like you, to help maintain our zoning laws and hope they're being used correctly and not because of possible competition in our area and keeping the community vision alive 
trying to dispel any hint of any negative climate towards business that might be considered that might be considering Fulton in their future business plans for expansion or relocation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take a rare opportunity here and speak on my own behalf. I'm Doreen Hanavy. Um, many of you know me from my professional job as a reporter. Um, fortunately for me, I no longer cover this area, so I'm allowed to speak as a resident of this area. My views do not represent my publication. Um, I've heard concerns about the neighborhood and it falling down in value. I've heard suggestions that perhaps converting this property into housing for single family homes will help the neighborhood prosper. I myself made a commitment to this community May 26, 1992, when I became a resident of Fulton. I do not have the extended history of some of the people in my neighborhood. I would like to continue living here. I would like to see the community grow. I, I'm a tenant, I'm a renter. Some of you may not like that. I've tried to make a positive contribution to this neighborhood. I've tried to deal with it professionally. I think that some of the things this community needs to turn around are more young professionals like myself. Um, someday you'll be turning to people like me to help you succeed in life. Um, the failure of economic growth in city, I don't feel, in this city, I don't feel that weighs on my shoulders alone. You take a look at Miller Brewing. You take a look at Owens Brockway. You look at your own business, Ron Nestle. You're struggling too. Um, we need businesses to be revitalized. We need businesses who can support themselves. Um, Mr. Morbido, I've heard wonderful things about your store. I've been there a couple times myself. I look out here and I see all the support you have. I don't see that changing. Um, I know that my shopping ha habits will not change because of him. I know where I want to do my business. Um, if he can give me a, a hot cup of coffee, and man, you know, I guess I'm going to have to make it down to your other store. Um, I live, right now, I live at 10 and a half North 7th Street. Prior to that, I lived at 707 Oneida Street. So I'm right in the neighborhood. Um, I have watched smaller stores try to succeed um, in the building adjacent to the, the longer business supply store. Um, I saw a ski shop there, I saw a tobacco shop there. Um, I hated to see them move in and out so quickly. Uh, I would like to see that property used productively. I've heard Carol Rutledge explain how she tried to market, um, <coughs> what's that, the wood, of, the wood establishment, is she gone? Um, I'm nervous. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Copper Beach. I mean, that, that, those properties just aren't selling. And like I said, I live in a rental property. Um, be up front with you, it's owned by Russ Johnson. I'll put it right on the floor. Uh, he's been trying to sell that property for three years now. It's not going anywhere. I don't see how housing is gonna grow in that site. I just would like to see something be able to move and prosper there. I don't see how you can penalize this man just because he has a, a similar business that's already there. That should not be an issue. That is not a legal issue. You need to look at the basics that are in the code, and I would request that you do that. Thank you. Got a little worked up, and I wanted to make sure what I you know, understand what I came here for. My my, um, it wasn't so much to speak to this issue, is what happened prior to this issue, which was the vote. And I wondered how the governance rules works tonight, if it's a tie vote. We have some questions of legality, whether the mayor can break a tie or not, and I just wondered if, in case of a tie tonight, because obviously it's a simple zoning issue tonight, whether we change from C1 to C2 because of gas tanks. That's as simple as I can put it. If tonight you're going to do 3-3, three, three, and there's all these questions that have been legally asked about um, some of the laws Alderman Terramidji had written specifically in the paper about some of the questions about what it was, and Mr. Ho and, and, um, Mr. Hawthorne wrote in the paper that it was just a simple language change. 
obviously I'm not sure what it is and I don't think the public is so we just want to make sure since this is an issue of zoning that this vote tonight that's going to be taken if it has to be broken by the mayor is even legal can you explain Mr. Hawthorne, Hawthorne if it's just a language problem or if it was actually a charter change and it does deserve a referendum. That's my huge concern because it sort of makes this vote null and void if that's an illegal vote. Do you understand my concern? First, Ms. Trovich, I, I, if you have a problem with this, I, I have to turn the tables for a second and ask why you didn't come here when we changed the charter. Well, I, I, it, this isn't confrontational because I wasn't no, in town and I had a very sick grandmother. Okay. That's why I wasn't here. But what brought my attention to it, Mr. Hawthorne, is just the, li the letters in the paper. And I did call a couple of aldermen today when I started saying, what's going on here? Well, I'm saying if this is illegal, then the zoning change in itself tonight would be, could be questioned. And what, I understand your question. Where, you said I wrote something in the paper? What paper did no, I write in? No, it was either I heard on television or on the paper. Just it was a matter of a word change, or maybe when I talked to Mr. Weston tonight. It was a matter of not changing the charter to change the voting thing, but it was just a matter of clearing up language in the charter. Okay. I, I'll answer your question, Kathy. I'm sure. sorry if I sound confrontational. It's just uh, the charter as written now, as was changed in, um, I believe it was November, allows the mayor to vote in case of a tie. The charter is written before that change allowed the mayor to vote in case of a tie. I um, was aware, I believe early last week, that there was some question risen as to whether or not that change was subject to a mandatory referendum under the uh, municipal home rule law. And I had researched that issue prior to changing it and felt it was not, and I still feel that way. And I wrote what I feel was a uh, precise and detailed letter to the alderman and the mayor last week explaining why I feel that way and I still feel that way. I don't feel that that change <coughs> was subject to mandatory referendum and that um, the mayor can vote if there's a tie. Well, can I ask a question then? Certainly, John. Um, why did we advertise for a public hearing to uh, amend the charter? If that be the case, then it should have went to public referendum. When we advertise for a public hearing, the public hearing notice said a local law which amends C40 of the city charter, which gives the mayor the ability to vote in order to break a tie. Okay, then they have another. They have are a, you going to let me answer each of these in turn, or are you going to ask all three? Well, no, I, I'm just reading this information I want to put into the record. Also, there's another resolution here that, that Kathy, uh, the meeting Kathy wasn't at, that uh, where we did have a public hearing to give the mayor the ability to vote, where two aldermen voted against that. Um, at that time, I didn't think it was right or illegal to begin with, and I didn't think it was right to give the power to the mayor when he's the executive branch of government. And then also, uh, here's um, some information that was sent November 27th, 2000, the state records of Law Bureau in Albany that says, uh, I am enclosing for your file local law 14 and 15 of the year 2000, which was adopted by the City Council of the City of Fulton on November 21st, 2000. Said local law is fully executed as required. And it basically in here specifies that the mayor is able to break a tie and on a vote that uh, uh, is a tie. And uh, if those things weren't um, subject to a public hearing, then why does it state in Section 23 of the Municipal Home Rule Law, uh, local law is subject to mandatory referendum? And then you go to um, B, it says, in the case of a city, town, or village changes the membership or composition of the legislative body or increases or decreases the number of votes to which any is entitled to cast. And that night, that's what we did. We gave the mayor the ability to break a tie. No, we didn't. He already had that. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. Well, then why did we, then why did we enact this law? We'd better define it, John. 
<laughs> That's a stretch, David. No, it's not a stretch. The I, I mean, I, this is not it something is that, that an attorney and a client should argue about in public, John, but our prior code stated that the mayor can vote in case of a tie except when a majority of the council is required for passage. So he already had the power to vote in case of a tie. So it is not a stretch to say he didn't. Then, then why do we have a law that says specifically that he can vote and break a tie? I guess that's my question to you. It already said he could vote and break a tie. No, this, this, this is a copy oh, yeah, yeah. of the section of the ordinance that was in effect at the last hearing. That's, that's uh, the, the way last I read hearing. before we changed it. I'm about to no, listen, please. The mayor and aldermen of said city shall constitute the common council thereof. Right. Now, Wait, that, that makes the mayor a member of the common council. But it doesn't say now, you have a vote. No, listen, please, please, just continue to listen. At all meetings of the common council, each alderman present shall have one vote. Right. In case of a tie, the mayor shall cast the deciding vote unless the issue being voted upon is one which requires a majority vote of the entire council for passage. Well, the first sentence says, I am a member of the council. I understand. So if it needs a, a majority vote of the entire council for passage, and there are seven persons on the council, a majority vote is four. Do you still agree with me? You're the executive branch of government, Your Honor. No I, matter how you I'm, look at it. I'm not arguing that point, John. Well, then I'm arguing what I'm saying is what... I don't want to argue with what, you. No. I'm, just what, I'm just telling you what we passed in the legislation, which is totally different from what you're saying there. No. All we did... Then why, then why all, does it say it? All we did is remove the ambiguous language that says unless the issue being voted upon is one that requires a majority vote of the entire council for passage. That's all we removed. That's the only change that was made to that. But, but, but you, all right. but, I had the authority to break a tie before we changed the charter. Not on zoning issues, Your Honor. Not on zoning issues. Why not on zoning issues, John? It's never... Ask, ask the former Ryan Woodward. It's never been done. Ron Woodward? Are you currently Ron Woodward? I'm still Ron Woodward. Is <laughs> he not the former Ron Woodward? <laughs> former Ron. <laughs> we, we amended the charter. That's what we did, giving you the power to vote that night. We, we did that. David, do we need do we need a majority rule from the council to amend the zoning laws? Specifically, the zoning laws. Because this is the issue in question. It's not the issue in question, but... It's well, it is, because... It, no, it's not unless the mayor votes on this tonight. 177.50, after public hearing and referral to and report by the Planning Commission, a majority vote of the members of the Common Council shall be required to amend the zoning ordinance. So the answer is yes. That's the question that needed to be answered. So we and did. Right, I understand it now. Right. That's the question but I need to know. If the there zoning was, requirements I'm needed sorry, yes. or a supermajority. No. That's what I needed to know. No, just it needed says, no. a majority of the entire council. That's right. No, it, what I had to see is if it was to the zoning. Yes. And that's what it was, and, and I couldn't get a hold of a charter today. And zoning. But then that would be okay. Zoning does require a majority, and the Not reason. A super majority. And the reason that it requires a majority is so that just a quorum, if a quorum was present you may not get the majority of the council vote. Right, correct, correct. It's the, clarified now, that's all I needed to say. As I said, in the organization of the, of the council, in the charter, we did not change the organization. All we did was take out the ambiguous language that said, unless the issue being voted upon is one which requires a majority vote of the entire council for passage. Right. Which if the mayor is a member the of the council, right. then it requires a majority vote of the entire council. Correct. 
is four members. That's all I came for is clarification. I, I really, just for, for one more because further. I couldn't get an answer if it was the zoning. Very Some of them needed more than one plus a majority. There was many tricky things in our charter. Assessments, yes. Yes. assessments yeah. require majority. And just for further clarification, Kathy, and I, you know, I hate to get into this issue too much for people that, especially an issue that may not even be relevant tonight, um, unless everybody knows something I don't know about how the votes going to go, but. Also, the reason that this came up was because we were in litigation, as everybody knows, over this particular issue. And in that litigation, there was a difference of, difference of opinion. Right. In fact, the petitioners were arguing that the mayor should have voted that night because the language is shell in case of a tie. Mm -hmm. It was our opinion, based on that ambiguous language, that he couldn't vote that night. Right. And again, because there was litigation and there, was ar there were arguments both sides, which, which issue was not resolved in court because the only one issue was resolved by the court, and that's why we're back here tonight, and that was the notice deficiency. Because of that litigation, we felt that there was an ambiguity in the charter that we had to fix, and that's why we Which fixed we've it. seen many, and I really only came here for clarification because I wasn't sure if we put in the cart before the horse, and I've been through the charter where you have to make 80 change for one change, and I couldn't get a hold of a charter. That's the only thing. I, no thank problem. you. I you, appreciate the If you have questions in the future, please give me a call. I did call two aldermen today. I just didn't get a chance. It was like all of a sudden all these questions, people started I talking. And I understand. That's all. Thank I, I you. will try to answer any questions that I you have. I appreciate it. Is, is, there, <laughs> is there anyone else that has uh, would like to speak on the uh, zone change issue? There's no one else from the public that would care to speak on this. Is there anyone on the council that would care to speak on this? Um, of course. <laughs> of course. Um, obvious, obviously, we have had a very difficult issue that we have to deal with, uh, as evidenced by the, the divided council. Uh, we certainly have heard from everyone tonight, some more than once. I think it was an excellent public hearing. I know myself, um, and I think all the aldermen, we've had sufficient time to investigate and explore, ask questions. Uh, we received letters, received phone calls, conversations to help us to make what we consider is the best decision. So prior to the meeting, um, over the last few weeks, I did put down some thoughts, some questions, and I'd like to share those with the council now and the public. The questions that I asked myself was, what is the best use of the property? What is the criteria that the council should consider? And what is in the best possible interest of the public? Some of these things have already come up tonight, and it'll be repetitive. The property is zoned commercial and is operated for such for over 70 years. The property has been up for sale for close to three years. I was asked by a concerned neighbor as to why not turn the property into residential housing. And as Carol Rutledge mentioned, she mentioned uh, Copper Beach Commons that was built in 1994 with eight units of buyer-assisted housing, of which the last unit was finally sold last year. In addition, there has been very few new housing, uh, um, excuse me, housing starts in the last few years. The property contains five vacant buildings which, if left in their condi present condition, will continue to be a safety concern. The city will be forced to take over for back taxes and demolish a taxpayer expense. Then you are left with a large vacant lot. It would be nice if, as a city, we could have the luxury of picking and choosing as to what goes here and there. Developers are driven by demand and opportunities to successfully operate, whether they are builders or business people. Market research is extensively done to determine the best locations for their needs. It would be nice if we could fill vacant buildings and vacant properties before new buildings are built, but that's not reality. With a new business on Oneida Street, it would become an improvement to the area from an appearance standpoint and provide property and sales tax. I talked to City Assessor Diane Moore and I asked her if the development would have an adverse effect on property values. In her opinion, it would not, and if anything, it would be positive as opposed to vacant buildings, or at the least, it would remain the same. The criteria that the council should be considering is what is in the public's best interest. I was contacted by phone and in person by a concerned neighbor who lives a block away. 
I was contacted by phone by another neighbor whose property is behind the Collins property. I was contacted in person by a business person who believes that the business would be affected by another store coming into the area. I was contacted by letter by a person whose property is behind the Collins property. I was contacted by letter by a supplier whose business could decline if a competitive store was to locate in the neighborhood. I was contacted by a resident who was concerned that the vacant buildings are a safety hazard and feared that a fire would impact surrounding homes. It is my understanding from talking to the city attorney and by his letter to the council on September 28th that the legal standard we needed to follow is whether the request would be in the interest of the health, safety, or welfare of the, of the community. So based on that consideration, uh, I am supporting the zone change. Okay, Mayor Zahowski. I want to thank all of you for being here um, and expressing all of your opinions, whether they were negative or positive. All of us sitting at the council table here gave hard thought and consideration on this issue. Expression of opinions is one element this country was built on, the right to express opinions. Whether these opinions are negative or positive, we must respect those individuals. As I said, this country was built on those elements. Competition cannot legally be shut out, cannot single out the benefit of a single or multiple owners of any business. I hear that this would de decrease valuation of the surrounding area. This, I believe, did not happen in the area of Wilson Farm on West Broadway. Nor this did not happen with the addition of a of gas pumps at Stripler's. I serve on the marketing committee for the Chamber of Commerce, which one direction is to seek and promote business, etc. in our city. We must try to work into the future. The Collins property, as it stands, is a non-working property. Can the city afford more vacant buildings and the cost of demolition? We already have vacant buildings and property that people are not rushing in to buy, build, or renovate. Wilson Farms will add to the tax roll and clean up that area. This, I believe, is in the best general interest and the welfare of the city and the majority of taxpayers. I thank you. Thank you. Your Honor, um, I, after the first public hearing, I had gone, or before the first public hearing, I had gone over and solicited uh, people's comments in that area, and um, I felt that the people over there, they were telling me that they, they did not want this in that neighborhood. They wanted to bring it back to a residential type neighborhood. And under the Don Bullard administration, uh, that was uh, something that we made a commitment to, um, bringing neighborhoods back to being neighborhoods. Um, and I'm very strongly um, opposed to the zone change only for the fact that it's going to um, changed the aspect of that neighborhood in a negative way for the people who live there, who have to reside there, will be. So I'm, I'm opposed to this over change. Thank you. Alderman Sherman? A lot of the things I was gonna say have already been said, so I'm not gonna go back over them, but I'd like to say to the council that, first of all, you are elected as leaders. And sometimes, as a leader, you've got to make very difficult decisions. And with that said, too, that obviously this is going to be a very difficult decision because you've got people on both sides of the aisle that are in favor or opposed. You know, you've got your list as to who's opposing it. A lot of the neighbors around that particular area are against it. I have never, I, my position on this type of zoning issue in the city has remained constant. Uh, I did talk to Alderman Woodard about it, saying that I would never vote for something in his backyard that I would not vote for in my backyard. And I have done that with the George Vallette property. 
Uh, we're going to have an auto zone there now because he has sold the property, and it is in my backyard. I am not wishing this on any of those neighbors down there, but it does come down to a dollars and cents. The city is a business. We have to make business decisions. We are the leaders of that business, and we have to base it on those facts. And the problem here is that, do we want to acquire this property through back taxes, tear that thing down, and I as a taxpayer, personally, I don't want to pay for that. I don't want to pay for it, and I don't expect my neighbor to have to pay for it. Okay, so that's really, it really comes down to that. And the government should never, again, I didn't want to cover what other people have said, but government is not up here to make decisions who's going to be competitive and who's not going to be competitive. For all we know, Marbidos may not be there in five years anyway through his own, he may retire. When, when Mr. Marbido retires, who's going to run that store? We don't know. And then you're going to have another empty building down there not through the law, not through competition, but just through the mere fact that somebody has retired. Barbito at one time did have a monopoly in the city. They had three stores, okay? And it's really, it wasn't Fulton's community. It wasn't the leadership to determine who's going to compete and who, who wasn't going to compete. And it really comes down to making a difficult decision. I am not going to vote against people tonight, but I am going to vote for what they're going to pay for and what they're not going to pay for. They are not going to pay for tearing that building down if it's up to me. It's that simple. And they are not going to be subjected to a building that's going to have a roof fall in in another year when the ice builds up on it. They're not going to pay for that type of situation. I'm not going to put that neighborhood through any more tax devaluation because of a building that's in decline. I think we have a responsibility. We have a very difficult decision to make tonight, and we have to make it. This is not a vote against Alderman Woodard's ward. It is not a vote against Alderman uh, Lincoln and his w efforts that he has committed. It is a vote for the community. Okay, it is, I look at it right now, this is an opportunity to get some green space in that neighborhood down there. You've got a blacktop. <laughs> You've got a building with glass front on it that's an eyesore. Okay, here's an opportunity to get a brand new building in that neighborhood. I don't want to, and, and, and the idea that they're going to have a lot of walk-ins and this and that, why would they want to have gas pumps there if they're going to cater to just a walk-in market? If that's what they wanted to do, if, they, if they're just going to cater to a walk-in market, they could say scrap the gas pumps and build a thing there anyway. So I think that it's obvious they're, they're looking to service the community. And I'm not, again, I don't, wanna, I don't want people to think I'm being abrasive up here. I just feel that it's the best situation for the city. I'm not voting against people. I'm voting in favor of what is best for the taxpayer in this city. That's what it comes down to. Thank you. Alderman Thompson. Yeah, I've got a couple things to say this time around. Um, I didn't just took a couple of notes based on what I heard. And um, first of all, uh, I do think that free enterprise is a good thing. Um, if anybody knows what I do for a living, I make my money off a of free enterprise. And uh, it's good when the market goes up. It's bad when the market goes down. I'll hold is a great company. Um, my company actually has an outperform rating. We think your stock's going up. But I don't think I'm here to pass on whether or not you're a good company. Um, I heard a couple people talk about the marketing committee that the city has. I am one of the two aldermen that's on the marketing committee. And tonight, uh, there seems to be a big focus on bringing in business. But a bigger question that I have is, what is business? Is business a company with a good paying job where somebody can support their family? Or is it a corner store with a dozen high school girls making six bucks an hour? And I don't mean that to be sexist or not. Or bag boys. Or bag boys. That's what I meant that too. Um, I think that one of the focuses of that committee should be to replace jobs that were lost at Miller Brewing and at Owens, Illinois with real jobs and not replace an $18 an hour job that somebody's been at for 10, 15, 20 years with another gas station, another dollar store, another fast food place, the same slew of new business coming to Fulton that we've had for the last five or 10 years. I do believe that I was elected to voice the concerns of the people that I represent and to help bring forth their vision of what direction this city should be going through. And one way that we can help control that and go in that direction is through zoning. 
That's why God invented zoning laws. I understand some of the current concerns that people have about you know, maybe being open late at night. I live right behind Tom Marbido's store, and I love Tom to death, but I don't like all the riffraff that walks past my house at quarter and nine at night. And if you wanna see, like Ron told me earlier, if you wanna see what Wilson Farms is gonna look like at quarter or 12, come to my house at quarter and nine. It's gonna look probably pretty close. And I did count how many people came here tonight. I did count how many people spoke in favor and against, and uh, the no's win. So I'm going to be voting no. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think just about everything's been said, Your Honor. The only thing I'm gonna say is uh, I still have faith that we can bring the neighborhoods back. I think that government had a big hand, and uh, I've been part of government for a lot of years, and we make mistakes. I think we've been a big hand in the, uh, in the detriment of the neighborhoods. It didn't happen overnight. It certainly didn't happen in this administration or mine or Don Bullard's or Vern Drones or Muriel Allard's, but I think over the years it, we all had a hand in it. Uh, and for all the right reasons, they turned wrong. Usually they involve the quick buck. Um, I still would like to see the neighborhood go back to a neighborhood, and uh, I don't think that I'm going to be around long enough to see what would I would like it to be, but uh, I have children who live in the city and I have grandchildren, and, and maybe someday uh, it will be a little nicer and uh, we won't be having this conversation, so I don't support it. Uh, and I respect the people you know, on how they feel. Thank you. Thank you. I have anguished over this decision for a couple months now. It's not easy. I can understand the concerns of some of the neighbors. This is a new, unknown. Everybody is afraid of the unknown. But we have talked, this administration has talked for three years now of supporting economic growth in the city. And what kind of message are we sending to prospective developers if we do not work with them? The only way we are going to get businesses to come into this city is to work with the businesses because they are going to tell us where they want to be. And if we cannot provide that place for them, they are not going to locate in this city. The only zoning that we're looking at here, the only thing that we're voting on tonight is the gas pump issue. If it, if it wasn't, no, if it wasn't for the gas pump, they could be, they could, the store could be built already. That is the point. The store can go there. So the argument about competition for Mr. Morbido is a mute issue. It, it doesn't exist. You just said because they want to put business there and because they won't put the business there unless you change the zoning. They, There's no sense having zoning laws. That's right. Because this is commercial. If they were going to go into a residential area, a, a, an area that is zoned completely residential, I would be entirely against this. Listen, just, just, just listen. Just listen to me, please. Where do you live? Okay. Is that a residential area? Is it a residential area? Is it zoned residential? Okay. <laughs> that, that is another situation. And I, I understand your concern. I understand your concern. No. Choices have to be made. And these are not easy choices. 
Not at all, not for any of these people sitting up here. This is very difficult. In the three years that I've been here, this is the most difficult situation I've had to deal with. No, because I thought there was something wrong with the charter. I thought that I should have the chance the first time, to be honest with you. And that's right, and I understand this. And if you can find another place that is better, yeah, I think I think that you need. That's right. Okay, but that's what we're talking about. If you're looking to go back to residential for that area, think about it. Where are people building new homes today? Are they building them in close-packed neighborhoods? No. They want homes. If they're going to invest $100,000 to $150,000 in a home, they want a large yard. They want trees. <laughs> and all you got to do is go over and look on the west side, over there at, uh, at the Patrick tract over there. Tannery Lane. Tannery Lane, and you will see that. The houses are separated. There are wooded lots. If you go out into Volney, just off Old Maple Avenue, in the Rowley complex over there, are the houses on top of one another? No, they are not. It, no, it's not going to be a ghetto. It's, them going in there is going to improve that area with, uh, from what it is right now. We've got people, I've got uh, real estate people that have already lost some business potential customers over what happened at the last vote. Uh, I think it would kind of be kind because of Because there wasn't any gas station down there? There's a whole bunch of there? CEOs sitting around looking through the Fulton Daily News. No, I'm I, saying we don't know how many we've lost, but there's been at least one that has talked to a, a, a realtor that said, if that's the attitude they have, I don't want to be here. Uh, pardon, no. the, pardon the interruption. Can I, uh, can I say something? Mr. Mayor, no, I just, just, I'm trying to keep up on my notes. Has the public hearing been closed yet? No, no. Council? I'm, I'm yeah, just thanks. making comments that I will close the public hearing, or the council will. Should, should these people, Your Honor, be penalized because they don't live or are building a house no, in, no, a, in, no. a, in a tannery lane? No, no, not at all. Not but, at all. But that's but, what, that's now, just what listen to me. Listen to me, please. Right now, with the zoning that is there, if Mr. Collins could find somebody that wanted to open a bar there, it would be there and you couldn't stop it. That's right. You can't stop No. No. Would a bar be better than Wilson Farm for, for that community? What I have to do in my position, as I feel, is I have to look out for the overall good of the city. Are some people going to be not happy with this? But Definitely. Definitely. All the people that live down there, just about. Well, I think that if this does transpire, that the Wilson Farms people will work with the neighbors to make this just as easy as possible, because it is the unknown. I understand that, Your Honor, but let me tell you something. The site plan review and all the stuff that happens, okay, how long have we been waiting for Mr. Natoli to do what he said he was going to do originally when he started that complex over there where KBC used to be. Okay, I so site plan doesn't work all that great. It, it's a nice idea, but it's not implemented properly and it's not enforced properly. That's right. So we have to enforce it. We've, I uh, agree. we've installed a mechanism <coughs> for my suggestion to the planning board, John, that they're going to start requiring performance bonds for green space issues and dumpster uh, screening issues. So another, so that what happened over there is not going to happen again. We cannot afford to have our tax base erode anymore. We have too much non-taxable property in the city right now. We don't need any more of it. We have to support economic growth in business if we are going to move forward. As I said, I am very sensitive to quality of life improvements. 
but I have to look at quality of life for the entire city, not one specific area. And from what I've seen tonight, Mr. Morbido, I don't feel that your customers are going to desert you to go to this new store if it is placed there. I really don't see that happening. Because they did a study that says it'll work there. They put the money into a study. We didn't make the study. Well, it's going to be, apparently, they, apparently they do. Look at, do I want one? No. No, I don't want one. Would I accept one if it's for the betterment of the city? Yes, sir, I would. I would not like it, but I would accept it, sir. I understand this. Is that the best interest of the entire city, sir? I don't. I, I will entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Green, green residential areas back. Yeah. Right. Bring in residential neighborhoods should be our top priority, Your Honor. Okay. We can we can correct residential areas just the way you talked by converting multifamilies back to single families. You're not going to get people to build in the existing neighborhoods. It's not going to happen. It's a pipe dream. You heard that tonight. <laughs> let's 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 get real about this. It's not going to happen. Now please. No, put yourself in those people's position. That's all I gotta say here. That's what I have been doing for the no, last you, two months. I don't think so. Or else, or else you would, or else you would say, "Hey, then, look, sir, people don't." Then, sir, you are questioning my integrity, and I'm not going to put up with that. I will entertain a motion to close this hearing. Move it. I'll say. All in favor. Aye. Aye. The motion is passed. Could you read the motion. The next motion, please. Whereas the mayor, members of the council, and all in attendance have been given an opportunity to give their written or oral comments regarding said proposed zone change request. Now therefore be it resolved that the proposed zone change from C1 commercial, C2 commercial for the property located on the southwest corner of Oneida South 7th Street for the purpose of constructing at Wilson Farms is hereby approved. I'll take a roll call. Roll call vote. Alderman Lincoln. Uh, no. Alderman Sahaski. Yes. Alderman Weston. Yes. Alderman Sherman. Yes. Alderman Thompson. Uh, no, and I have a question. Shouldn't there be somebody move that resolution before you take the vote? We have a bad idea. <coughs> we need a motion in a second before we can vote. Yeah, I'll Thank move you. It. Motion? Move it. Second? Second. Go through the vote again, please. Alderman Lincoln? No. Alderman Sahaski? Yes. Alderman Weston? Yes. Alderman Sherman? Yes. Alderman Thompson? Thank you, no. Alderman Woodward? No. Mayor? Yes. Motion's carried. Your Honor, make a motion, Major. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Meeting is adjourned. Oppose the adjournment. Did a great job. Oppose the adjournment. I got a little hot earlier. <laughs> well, you should have gone out. You didn't want to miss that.